asking Anne to call the roll. All right. If you would please announce your name when I announce the jurisdiction. <laughs> County of San Mateo. Dave Pine, and please admire my new beard. Wow. <laughs> Impressive. Thank it's you. My, we do appreciate that, Dave. My COVID-19 beard. <laughs> okay. Uh, County of San Mateo. Town of Atherton. City of Belmont. City of Brisbane. Madison Davis. City of Burlingame. Town of Colma. John Goodwin, Town of Colma. I think a lot of people are muted. Um, uh, Julia, Julia Mates is muted and I think she's... Uh, Ah, uh, okay. Julia, are you, I'm calling Julia? You in phone. Yeah, she was. Yep. Julia, are you there? She's with Bill. Yeah, okay. can you hear me? I'm calling in by phone, so I'm not using the audio on my computer. Okay, and I just received a text that Donna Colson is waiting to get in. So I've got Julia Mates. Um, I've got Dave Pine, Julia Mates, Madison Davis. John Goodwin, and I uh, was about to announce Daily City, but Donna is waiting to join. I suggest that you might mention to anyone who's waiting that you have to act, you, you download it, it goes into your download file. You have to actually double click on the download file item and say, yes, I want you to go activate. Hmm. You might let, let her know that. Um, That's what I had to do. This is Laura, I'll text her. Oh, thank you, Laura. Thanks, Laura. All right, uh, moving on. Uh, city of Daly City. Rod Das Magdwal. Thank you. City of East Palo Alto. Was that uh, City of East Palo Alto? Okay, City of Foster City. Catherine Mahampour. Thank you. City of Half Moon Bay. Town of Hillsboro. Larry May. Thank you. City of Menlo Park. Nope. Uh, City of Millbrae. Wayne Lee. Thank you. City of Pacifica. Deirdre Martin. Thank you. Town of Portola Valley. Jeff Alfs. City of Redwood City. Ian Bain. City of San Bruno. Marty Medina. City of San Carlos. Laura Palmer Lohan. City of San Mateo. Rick Podia. City of South San Francisco. Corey okay. Nicholas. Thank you, Floor. Town of Woodside. Daniel Yost, and can you confirm you can hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you, Daniel. Let me, uh, okay, Director Emeritus. John Keener. Thank you. Let me confirm, did you hear Rick Bonilla? Yes. Okay, good, thank you. Hello, this is Carol Groom from the County of San Mateo. There she is. Um, I also know Harvey's here, although he didn't, he didn't respond. I, I did respond. Oh, there you are. Okay, I hear you now. Um, the volume is still very, very low. I don't know if there's something on uh, my uh, phone or what's going on, but uh, I can barely hear anybody. Okay. I, you know. It may be on your end, Harvey. It's working pretty well yeah. on my end. You are pretty far away. <laughs> okay. Um, Anne, am I correct in, in, in concluding we have a, for, a quorum?
And we can't hear you. Oh, uh, Ann? Yeah. You lost her. Oh, you're right. I would like to give her a minute to come back on because we need her. All right. Oh, there you are. Anne, you there? Hey, Jeff, she's, uh, she hasn't called in yet, but she responded to me in a separate chat that we do have a quorum. Okay. Um, oh, and, and we're recording? Yes. Yes, we're recording. Okay. Uh, thank you all. Um, thank you all for your patience on this, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do the best we can. I'm going to start um, actually, uh, <laughs> I will uh, I'll start with public comment. If you have a public comment, I will ask you to uh, comment on an item not on the agenda. I'll ask you to raise your hand. We should push it up the list. Anyone wanting to make a public comment not on the agenda? Okay. Uh, where do you do that? Uh, seeing none. Where's the raise hand? Did you raise your hand, Mark? I, I'm looking for where it is to do it, but oh, I... uh, you click on participants. Well, I can hear you. So if you want to give us a comment, why don't you just go? go we'll, we'll, we'll. You got two minutes. Okay. All right. So um, there's a group that has uh, designed battery generators, uh, solar generators with batteries and uh, rugged and, and all that, um, reasonable price. And the problem is they don't have anything to show. Um, they're, they're on a very, very tight budget. And um, so I'm wondering if there might be some way we could work out something to uh, put a program together or at least just some way of, of, of maybe what am I trying to say? Um, some way of coordinating with PCE to um, reach out to people who need them. We're finding out who needs some, the solar generator battery combination. And uh, I don't know, I should probably talk to somebody on staff about that. Um, you could talk to someone on staff about that. I, I mean, it sounds like it's sort of complementary to the, the, um, the the uh, behind the meter RA program that we've been we've, we're we're sort of going through right now, um, okay. yeah. If you've got if you can talk to someone on staff, I I'd, I'd, I'd go there. It sounds interesting. So thank you. Yeah, okay. let's, let's start with that. Thank you. Um, okay. Any other comments? Uh, public comments not on the uh, items not on the agenda. Um, Jeff, I just got a text from Anne that says she's not in and she can't hear anything. So, um, okay, that's a problem. Oh, dear. Um, I'll suggest you try again. Yeah, I can see, I can online. see, uh, I can see that she's logged in on the web, but not on a, hasn't called in on the phone. So, oh, maybe there she, she needs to oh. just log out and log back in. And speak to us. She left, she left. Maybe she's doing exactly that. Okay. Um, she's trying her phone. Okay. Our motion to set the agenda. Wayne Lee. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Carol, Carol, the, second. Okay. Bonilla. I, I, I heard Rick first. So it's uh, moved by Lee, seconded by Bonilla. Um, uh, does anybody object? No. Normally we would, normally we would do a, uh, a roll call vote, but Anne's the roll call person. Um, <laughs> Anne, you're still not there? Uh, okay. All opposed to setting the agenda and accepting the consent agenda, say nay. 
Hearing none opposed, uh, we will say the consent agenda is set. Uh, the agenda is set, the consent agenda is passed. Um, next up is my report. Uh, in lieu of a report, I'll just uh, read off a few, uh, I'll just <clears throat> set a few ground rules for all of this. Um, first of all, um, Andy is hosting and will we'll, and will mute all of us including board members, just so we don't have too much noise on here. Just when you are ready to, when you need to speak on something, uh, unmute yourself in the participant screen. You click on participants at the bottom of the screen uh, and then you, there's a button on the right side of your screen that will say unmute me. Uh, you'll, you will need to do that though. Uh, if you're chatting, you can only chat with the host. Um, if you do have a comment, you can post in the chat window. It'll go to Andy and he can relay it to me. Um, if you do want to speak, you can raise your hand. I will see it and I will call on you. Um, I will ask that people wait to be called on and just not uh, and stay muted until I've called on you and not talk over each other. It's been a problem in some other meetings I've had. Um, if you are calling in for by telephone, uh, Andy will call for comments from telephone uh, from from call in participants. Uh, if you can't raise your hand, um, and for members of the public wishing to speak. Uh, same thing, if you're logged into the conference call by computer, you can raise your hand. If you're logged in by, if you've called in by telephone, uh, Andy will ask for comments or I will ask for comments and you can comment then. Um, and uh, as, as usual, we'll have a two minute timer up as we did before and we'll go from there. Um, that's all I have right now, I don't have a report. So I'll move on to the CEO report. Hi everyone, this is Anne. I was just able to get back in by phone. Ah. There you are, good. Okay, can you hear me? This is Jan. Yes, uh, Jan, go ahead. Jan, go ahead, Jan, go ahead. Ooh, lots of echoes there. Okay, uh, first slide please. So I have a fairly extensive CEO report because, as you know, a lot has been going on recently and I wanted to go over a number of things. Uh, I'll be going over a staffing update, uh, PCE assistance during this crisis, um, an update on uh, the COVID-19 update on how that's affecting staff and operations and our load impact, uh, upcoming rate changes, up, update on the PG&E bankruptcy, update on our activities in Merced County, um, outreach for our resiliency program, update on the right solar ribbon cutting and upcoming meetings. Next slide, please. So we have two positions open right now. We're currently recruiting for the manager of distributed energy resource strategy and a regulatory analyst. Next. So if you know of anyone who's interested, please have them. Go to our website and submit an application. Regarding PCE assistance, we will be presenting a proposal tonight on um, how we are suggesting we assist our CARE and FERA customers. But I also wanted to uh, mention that there is a group called San Mateo Strong that's providing assistance in the county. And we might wanna talk about whether PCE should provide assistance to that group as well. I also wanted to let you know what other CCAs are doing. Um, uh, actually, I will save that to uh, when we get to our Carafira customer uh, presentation and let you know what others are doing at that time. And uh, we might wanna think if there are other ways that PCE can help. Next slide, please. So as far as COVID-19 is going, as we are all sheltering at home, all of PCE staff are working from home. We're utilizing Ring Central's video conferencing capabilities and pretty much trying to keep work going as usual. It takes just a little longer to get some things done, but uh, we're all learning and um, things are moving along pretty well. The Cal Center, which is operated by Calpine, is continuing in its operation. Our operators are working from home and that's working out okay so far. Um, PG&E has stopped disconnections due to people not paying their PG&E bill. 
And actually we stopped our option as a CCA is that if someone isn't paying their bill, we can return them to PG&E and then PG&E will, will handle the, the payment issue. We actually stopped sending non-paying customers to PG&E over a year ago when we started getting involved in the affordability docket at the Public Utilities Commission. And actually, you know, compared to other areas, we don't have that many non-paying customers. PG&E has recently um, submitted an advice letter on additional things that they are doing to help customers. Uh, they're waiving deposit requirements and late fees. They're implementing flexible payment options. They have proposed a, an, a um, payment plan whereby a customer would pay no greater than 20% of the amount due in their bill, and then the remainder would be paid out in equal installments over uh, a number of billing cycles. Um, we have some concern about this because the way PG&E has proposed it, uh, once a, for any payments that are coming in, they would get paid first for their charges, as opposed to uh, distributing any payments among the different entities that are part of that bill. So example, if we're 40% of the bill, you know, we would expect that if a, someone's doing a partial payment, that 40% of their payment would come to us. That's not what PG&E has proposed. Um, Southern California Edison has also proposed a repayment just, uh, program as well, but they have proposed one where any payments that are made would be distributed based on the percentage of the bill that those charges um, make up. So uh, we are working with CalCCA to try to get PG&E online there to um, treat us equally to them in terms of uh, bill payments. Um, they are also uh, allowing people to sign up for medical baseline in an easier manner and also um, freezing eligibility reviews for care customers. So it will make it easier for people to uh, sign up to be a care customer or a medical baseline customer. We can go to the next slide. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what the impact has been on P PCE uh, with everyone at home. So we're gonna look at a number of charts that um, our power resources team has put together, uh, namely Medi, our new employee, and uh, look at the overall load, the changes by customer type and, and the load shape changes. Next slide, please. So um, since the shelter in place order has been put in, if we look at the last week of February uh, versus the week of March 16th, which was the week that the shelter in place occurred, our load has decreased about 6%. And if you look at the different types of customer classes, commercial load has gone down about 20%, but residential load has increased about 16%, not surprisingly, because we're all at home. Next slide, please. So just looking at our, the weekly load for um, the last four weeks, we can see how the load has decreased uh, during the week of March 16th. And this shows all the different customer classes and the different colors. Uh, residential is the orange bar there. And you can see that the orange bar has increased as far as the number and the other bars have all decreased. Next slide, please. When we look at our daily load, similar uh, kind of pattern that the um, daily load has decreased during the weekdays and uh, pretty much the weekends are staying uh, same as they were before. Next slide, please. And when we look by customer type, so you can see for the commercial uh, customers that the load has decreased and the load has increased for residential so the percentage split now between our residential load and our commercial load is, has changed a little bit in that uh, residential is now making up closer to maybe 40 to 45% of our overall load, when in the past it was more around 35 to 40. Next slide, please. And this is the load shapes. So this is the, uh, the vertical axis is the load in megawatt hours. The horizontal axis is the hour of the day. So it goes from hour one to 24. 
So if you look at that, um, the blue line is the week of February 24th, and the orange line is the week of, uh, the average is for the week of March 16th. So you can see that our load has decreased, uh, particularly in the evening hours, uh, when you look at just the residential, you can see how residential used to dip during the daytime when people were at work. Now the residential load is pretty flat in the, uh, during the day and then, and then goes up a little higher than it had before in the evening. For large commercial and medium commercial, the bump that we used to see in the middle of the day has flattened out quite a bit. Next, next slide. And if we look at the lo residential load shape uh, in more detail and note that the scale on the left hand side does not start at zero. It's just really emphasizing the, uh, the shape of the line here to show you how in the past, the red line is the week of February 24th that around uh, 9 a.m. would be the peak in the morning and then it would go down and then pick up again at around 6 p.m that that has flattened out and that the, the load is pretty constant throughout the afternoon. And then is peaking higher in the, uh, in the evening. Um, the next item I wanted to talk about was upcoming rate changes. So you may recall um, that the PCIA has a cap on it and typically, or we usually expect the PCIA to change in January of each year. Uh, the utilities have been missing that pretty consistently recently. Um, and so actually PG&E has submitted an advice letter to increase the PCIA to the cap of a half cent per kilowatt hour and that will be effective May 1st. They are also changing generation rates. Those are pretty much rate neutral for us. Some rates are going up, some rates are going down and we're, uh, staff is in the midst of evaluating that because you know we have uh, by 160, 170 rates that we need to look at closely to determine exactly what the rate change is for each of those. And we will bring this rate change to the board at the next meeting in April. One thing I wanted to note was that in our budget, we assumed that the PCIA uh, increase of a half cent would occur in January. Um, and had that occurred in January, you know, we, we would need to reduce our rates to reflect uh, the increase in the PCIA because we want to keep the 5% discount for our customers. So as the PCIA goes up, our rates go down. But because this is, is not being implemented until May, um, we expect that our revenues will come in higher than budgeted because our rates have been, uh, will, will not have been reduced until May 1st. The other part uh, that I wanted to talk to you about is a PCI trigger. The decision that was passed a year and a half or so ago about the PCIA does allow the PCIA to increase more than the cap if, the un if there are under collections of the PCIA and it reaches a certain amount. PG&E is calculating that this will happen in October and that the PCIA would increase a significant amount in October. Uh, because of everything that's going on, um, the, the rate shock that this would would create the uh, impact it would have on customers, the impact it would have on P CCAs. Uh, we are all working closely through Cal CCA to um, try to mitigate this and uh, figure out a way to allow them to, to collect the monies that they need, that, but to do it in a way that's not going to create uh, a big rate shock. So we'll keep you informed about that. Next slide, please. So I wanted to give you an update on the bankruptcy as well. Um, the governor withdrew his objections to the PG&E bankruptcy plan and is supporting the current plan. Um, part of the plan has $13.5 billion settlement for wildfire victims, which is funded 50% by PG&E stock. A couple weeks ago when PG&E stock was at a much higher level, that seemed okay. Uh, recently has taken quite a dive and so uh, apparently, uh, some of the people who agreed to this are now a little concerned that maybe this was not a good deal for them. Additionally, on Monday, PG&E ple pleaded guilty to 84 counts of involuntary manslaughter in Butte County, and they are paying a fine 
of only $4 million, uh, which will be paid out of the, fire, the Wildfire Victims Fund. Um, they will be sending out a plan of reorganization and disclosure statement, which needs to be sent out by March 31st. Uh, when we talk to our attorneys, they think that quite a lot of, that millions of these are going to be sent out. We expect we will receive one of these at PCE and uh, maybe your cities will receive these as well uh, and maybe some individuals. So people who are entitled to vote on the plan will receive ballots along with the reorganization statement and uh, those ballots will be due on May 15th, 2020. And then the bankruptcy court will look at those ballots and determine if, uh, if the plan is going forward. Uh, in the meantime, the PUC is, are you putting a timer on me, Andy? The PUC uh, proceeding is underway to determine if the plan meets the requirements of AB 1054. Um, is it rate neutral? Uh, is it in the public interest? Um, should securitization be allowed? And then the, uh, the bankruptcy process must be completed by June 30th for PG&E to access the $21 billion state wildfire fund. And then just a note that um, I'm sure you all know that PG&E is under probation for the San Bruno accident. This is in, in federal court. And one of the conditions of that probation was that they not break any other laws. So uh, the fact that they have now pled guilty to 84 counts of involuntary manslaughter, uh, it will be interesting to see what Judge Alsup does in, um, in that proceeding there. So moving along, next slide. The Merced County update. So we were uh, scheduled to make a presentation to the Los Bano City Council on March 18th. That has been delayed and we're currently scheduled on March, May 20th and uh, we'll see if that actually happens. In the meantime, we will be reaching out to council members in Los Banos to see if we can talk to them and answer any questions they might have about CCAs and about Peninsula Clean Energy. Uh, at our last meeting, we formed a subcommittee to start looking at the governance issues um, with uh, what the JPA allows and doesn't allow us to do and synergies between the two uh, groups. And we will also be discussing this with the CAC, the Citizens Advisory Committee to get their thoughts at their next meeting. Next slide, please. Um, on the resiliency side, you may recall that you passed a $10 million three-year program to um, focus on three areas of resiliency. One is to help the medically vulnerable get uh, clean energy storage so that if there is another uh, public safety power shut, out, shut off, that people will have backup power and be safe. We're also looking at community resilience centers and critical facilities. We have been working uh, closely with the San Mateo County Public Health Department, uh, but they are very busy right now. And so we are uh, hope to continue to be able to work with them to identify uh, medically vulnerable residents that could be helped with this program. Um, but we would also like to reach out to you in, the, in your cities for those communities that were impacted by the PSPS events if you can identify if there are specific nonprofits in your jurisdictions that we should partner with in order to reach the medically vulnerable customers. And um, rather than doing an RFP to have nonprofits, um, you know, make a proposal to us, we would prefer to get this moving more quickly and contact the best, uh, the best situated organizations directly um, and make sure that we're reaching the right, the right organizations. So I know that um, Kirsten has reached out to Harvey already for Half Moon Bay, and she will be reaching out to other uh, board members to ask you if you can identify specific um, agencies in your communities that would be best to help us in reaching these folks, uh, because we believe the county health department is busy otherwise. Next slide, please. Uh, the right solar ribbon cutting was set for May 8th. We are now looking at a date in September or October and we'll keep you posted on that. 
And then the last slide is our upcoming meetings in April. We expect that all of these will be by video and teleconference. The Citizens Advisory Committee will be on April 9th. The Executive Committee on April 13th and the Board of Directors on April 23rd. So I would be happy to answer any questions if, um, if folks have any questions. And I guess if you can raise your hand so that Jeff can see, then we can be happy to respond. Okay, thank you, Jen. And uh, yes, if you have a question, raise your hand. I see Daniel's hand is up. Daniel, why don't you go ahead. Uh, Daniel, you there? I think he, is he muted? I can't tell. Hello, can you hear me now? There you are, yes. Okay. Uh, I was muted before. I had to, uh, I'm on the video, but I'm also on my phone and I had to do the star six to unmute myself on my phone. Um, thanks, Jan, for that overview. Uh, obviously a lot going on. Uh, on the resiliency piece, um, you mentioned, you know, reaching out to nonprofits to put PCE in touch with medically vulnerable folks. Um, for some of the smaller towns, you know, mine, maybe Portola Valley, maybe Atherton, does it make sense to speak to the town manager or someone in town hall? Um, uh, you know, I think in some of these communities, the a program that may make sense is just coming up with a facility where people can go to uh, that has battery storage uh, plus solar. Uh, but just thought I would ask, uh, ask that question. Yeah, and actually we are doing that um, for looking at community resiliency centers and for critical facilities. Uh, the part of the program what we're talking about here is really reaching those uh, individual, these individuals who are medically vulnerable, who maybe need power because they're on uh, some type of medical equipment or they have to make sure their refrigerator is working because they have to keep their uh, medications refrigerated. So it's mainly people in single family homes who uh, maybe are homebound as well and couldn't easily get to another facility uh, in the case of a power shutoff. So that's what we're trying. Uh, so that, you know, it's a three pronged um, program and this is really focusing on the medically vulnerable who um, would be most comfortable staying in their own home or um, uh, care facilities that may have, uh, you know, a few folks who, who really aren't mobile and can't get to another location. Very helpful, thank you. Uh, does anyone else from the board have a question? Oh, uh, Laura, go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the uh, update, Jan. I just wanted to check in and just find out how you and the staff are doing with all of these changes and um, if everybody's um, you know, doing, doing well and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, we seem to be doing okay. Um, we're all working from home. Uh, a number of, you know, we've, we've I, for example, have brought my chair home because my back was killing me using my chair at home. Um, so we brought our monitors home and our computers and we're all hooked up. Um, and we continue, we usually meet on Zoom for our, our meetings so that we can see each other. Last Thursday, we had a little happy hour at five o'clock and invited the children and the pets and all of those to, to come on Zoom and say hello to each other, which was really nice since we don't get to see everyone like we usually do. But I think we're, from my perspective, it looks like we're doing well. We have a lot of, um, you know, communication. We, we use Slack regularly. So we're all 
kind of talking to each other a lot. Yeah, but thank you for asking. That's, yeah. uh, that's good. And it sounds like you've uh, kind of incorporated some virtual um, social time, which is really important right now. So uh, it's good to hear. Yeah, because we miss each other. You know, it's real different. Jeff, you're on mute. Thank you. Kat has her hand hey, up. Mark, Mark uh, if you wanted to speak, can you raise your hand and let, let us know instead of sending the chat? That would be great. I, I just wanted to say uh, thank you. I'll follow up separately with the nonprofits in my area. But, you know, we talk about emergency workers so much and how much we appreciate them. But it's the infrastructure that our, our the emergency workers do. Please, please, on behalf of all of us, uh, let your staff know how much we appreciate their hard work in, uh, in keeping this running so smoothly. A lot of times uh, people don't know we exist until there's a problem. And so far from what we can see, it's really working uh, shockingly well working from home. Maybe we're, we can learn something to take away from this in the end. But I just wanted to make sure that the staff know how much we appreciate them. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, I'll second that. Okay. Uh, did anyone else have questions for Jan? Um, if that's the case. I don't see any hands up. Um, that's the case, I will move on to the Citizens Advisory Committee report. I see Mark Roost with his hand up. I don't know if you can oh, see is it. Oh, is it? Okay, sorry, I didn't see your hand up, Mark. Uh, go ahead. I was hesitating because I thought I was supposed to send texts to Andy Stern and he asked me to stick my hand up and not send texts to him. So anyway. Yeah, so I know there's a lot of logistics and so let's just be clear about how we're gonna do this. Um, I told Jeff, I told Jeff that you had sent the chat. I forwarded that on, and then he asked me to ask you to raise your hand. So that's oh, what okay. I did. I'm, okay. I'm not a very fast typist. I'm. Uh, well, I, I do know, see it. Uh, as fast I, as I can. It's all right. I, I see that that message. That was why I was just sort of hesitating. Okay, so um, this was about the medically vulnerable. Breathe California of Silicon Valley does outreach and would be a good partner if not already involved. I would like to get details about the medical needs program. The company I mentioned is focusing on organizations serving patients, so there may be a match there. What about medically vulnerable people in multifamily residential? If we find concentrations of them in specific buildings, we could look at solar canopies as well as getting building owners to allow roof installations and running conduit down outside walls where necessary. I know that because I've done it on my apartment. What was the name of the first agency you mentioned? First okay. agency, Breathe California of Silicon Valley. They're, they're, okay. um, they're in San Jose. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that'd be great to, to reach out to them. Thanks, Mark. You're welcome. Um, are there other hands up? I, sorry, Mark, I didn't see your hand up, but are there other hands up that I don't see? It's weird. Okay. If there are no other questions for Jan right now, uh, I will move on to the uh, Citizens Advisory Committee report. Uh, Desiree? Hi, Jeff, can you hear me? Yes. Um, unfortunately, I don't actually have a report to give. We didn't meet this month. Um, there was a high likelihood we wouldn't reach quorum, but we plan to meet virtually like this meeting um, next month. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, under, understood. I think yeah, a lot lot happened this month, um, but uh, yeah, we'll try to get we'll try to we'll make sure we meet on April 9th and uh, go on from there. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to the audit and finance committee report. Donna, would you like to give that report, please? Sure. Um, so we had our meeting today, and we were able or not today um, last month. I wish it were today. 
Uh, and we were able to go over and do some research on, uh, we started off with six money managers, investment managers that we were looking at. Um, Larry and Andy narrowed it down to, um, I think Andy narrowed it down to three, Larry and Andy together narrowed it down to one that sort of clearly stood out uh, head and shoulders above the rest. We're going to talk about that in item number seven today um, on the board agenda, so I won't go into it too much. Um, but suffice it to say that um, that was our main project. And with the markets kind of colliding and going as nuts as they are right now, I think we were very opportune and the timing was great to really get this sort of diversified and um, future-proofed. So that's really about it from audit and finance, unless Andy has anything else to, um, to say. Nope. I think that covers it. Okay. Uh, Larry, did you have any comments on that, beyond that? And, and mm -hmm. thank you for your, uh, your work on that, by the way. Uh, thanks. Uh, no, I didn't have anything further. Okay. Uh, any questions for Donna or the committee? I don't see any hands up, so uh, unless, unless I'm missing something, we'll move on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Item five is the selection of the chair and vice chair. Uh, we had a uh, committee, of, a nominated committee, and that was chaired by Wayne, I believe. So uh, Wayne, are you ready to, to move forward on this? Anybody hear me? <laughs> I hear you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, um, yeah, the committee met online uh, through email and we had a uh, application process um, we received two applications, uh, one from um, uh, Jeff Alps for chair, chairman and then one from uh, Rick Degon Degon <laughs> eh, sorry, Degonia for, uh, for uh, vice chair. And then uh, just a couple of days ago, I received, the e I, I saw an email from Ann. Uh, my apologies, I didn't see it until, uh, until after the application process was completed and the, and the committee voted uh, to nominate uh, Jeff and um, Jeff and Rick. Um, and the people on the committee were uh, Kat Carlton, Rick Mania, and um, uh, Larry, Larry May. Um, thank you all for participating. Um, and <clears throat> the other person uh, didn't call me. I didn't call that person because it was kind of late in the process and the committee already voted to for the nominations. So uh, Mr. Chair, I recommend that you open the, you know, uh, again, open as you normally do in your procedures is to open the uh, floor to nominations. And that's my report. Okay, thanks, Wayne. And thank you to the committee for, for your work on this. Uh, yes, I will, uh, I will open the, the floor up now to nominations for, uh, well, first for the uh, board chair position. I nominate Jeff uh, Alps. Is there a second? Second. Okay. From Rick Bonilla. Thanks, Rick. Uh, are there any other nominations for board chair? Okay, I do not see any. Uh, in that case, um, we can, uh, I believe we need to do a roll call vote on this. So, uh, Ann, can you call the roll on this? And the, the yes. motion is nominating me as the, uh, to continue as board chair. Okay. All right. For the board chair, if you would please announce your name when I announce the jurisdiction. County of San Mateo. County of San Mateo. Town of Atherton. City of Belmont. Julia Nate. I'm, I'm sorry, County thank of Santa Fe. Fine. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you were scaring me there, Dave. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, City of Brisbane. Madison Davis. City of Burlingame. Donna Coulson. Uh, yes. And I, I should verify, okay, that, that uh, if you would announce your name and 
a yes or no. So I've got Dave as a yes, Julia Mate with a yes. Uh, yes. Madison Davis. Yes. Yep. Okay. And Donna was a, a yes. Town of Colma. John Goodwin, yes. City of Daly City. Rod Dosnick, well, yes. City of East Palo Alto. City of Foster City. Catherine Mahompour, <clears throat> yes. City of Half Moon Bay. Housing Rodak, yes. Town of Hillsboro. Larry May, yes. City of Menlo Park. Catherine Carlton, yes. City of Millbrae. Wayne Lee, yes. City of Pacifica. Deirdre Martin, yes. Town of Portola Valley. Jeff Alfs, I will abstain. City of Redwood City. Ian Bain, yes. City of San Bruno. Marty Medina, yes. City of San Carlos. Laura Parmer Lohan, yes, and thank you. Thank you. City of San Mateo. Rick Bonilla, and yes. City of South San Francisco. Flora Nicholas, yes. Town of Woodside. Daniel Yost, yes. Okay, the motion passes. Congratulations. Thank, thank you all. Um, I'm gonna turn some lights on before I disappear. Uh, next up is uh, nominations for the uh, vice chair position. Uh, this Wayne, I uh, like to nominate. I'm, I like to uh, nominate uh, Rick DeGoya for vice chair. Is there a second? Second, Rick Bonilla. Okay. Are there any other nominations for vice chair? Well, since we had two people put their names forward, should we not uh, have a vote? Did we? Did we have two people? I sorry. No, we had. We only nominated the chair, and then we voted just now. <laughs> Uh, for didn't we have someone put their name forward for vice chair? Oh, you mean other than um, than Rick? Yes. We didn't get an application, and we uh, and the chair opened up the uh, nominations for vice chair. No, nobody nominated another vice chair. Well, I'm 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 opening up the so Nick oh, Rick sorry, is nominated, the and I was opening it up for uh, for other nominations right now. Okay. Yeah, I misspoke. I I misspoke. I meant the chair. Um, okay, so the motion right now is to uh, is voting for uh, Rick Degolia to continue as vice chair. Um, well, and again, did we not have someone else put their name forward to be vice chair? Apply to us. We no. The answer is no. My understanding uh, was no. Yes. I wasn't there. Not a woman. No. But okay. if you want to nominate somebody now, you can nominate somebody. No, I'm, I'm fine. I, <laughs> I, I just thought that there was a, someone that had given us her name late. There was, there was, um, there was a, uh, a, a late, um, not, I don't know what late, but they didn't follow the process. But then I said, well, that case, just nominate that person if you want to. And who uh, is that person? Um, well, see, that's just it, is that, I'm not sure that person still wants to nominate, so that's why I said, okay, Chair, you can- Why are you being door. cryptic? What is her name, please? What, what is it? Okay, well, I got, um, I, I can't say if this person really wants to follow through, but, and, but um, the nominations was uh, Rick DeGoya for, for Chair and, um, and Carlos uh, Romero's for Vice Chair. Okay. But, they, but like I said, I didn't receive application, I didn't receive a call, so I wasn't sure if that person uh, withdrew their nominations or what? Okay. All right. So I said the proper way to do this would be for the chair to open the uh, nominations. Okay, that's fine. I just wanted to know exactly what was what had been put forward. I'm on the, the committee and it wasn't even told. So thank you. Okay, so we have a nomination for Rick DeGolia to continue as vice chair and a second. Um, if there are no other nominations, then we could do a roll call vote on Rick. Okay, the roll call vote for 
Rick DeGoia as vice chair, if you would please announce your name and a yes or no as I announce the jurisdiction. County of San Mateo. Dave Pine, yes. County of San Mateo. Town of Atherton. Rick DeGoia, City of, yes. City of Belmont. Julia Mate, yes. City of Brisbane. Madison Davis, yes. City of Burlingame. Donna Colson, yes. Town of Colma. John Goodwin, yes. City of Daly City. Odd uh, Best Magdwell, yes. City of East Palo Alto. City of Foster City. Catherine Mahampur, yes. Catherine Mahampur, are you there? Yes, I, I said, said yes. Mahampur, yes. <laughs> oh, she did. Okay, sorry, I didn't yes. hear that. Thank you. Uh, okay, City of Half Moon Bay. Rawback, yes. Town of Hillsboro. Larry May, yes. City of Menlo Park. Catherine Carlton, yes. City of Millbrae. Wayne Lee, yes. City of Pacifica. Deirdre Martin, yes. Town of Portola Valley. <coughs> Jeff Alfs, yes. City of Redwood City. Ian Bain, yes. City of San Bruno. Marty Medina, yes. City of San Carlos. Oh, thank you, Marty. That was a yes. Okay. Laura Palmer. City of San Laura Palmer. Palmer. Laura Palmer Lohan, yes, and thank you. Thank you. City of San Mateo. Rick Bonilla, yes. City of South San Francisco. Laura Nicholas, yes. Town of Woodside. Daniel Yost, yes. Thank you, and the motion passes unanimously. Great, thank you all. Um, look forward to another year of this. Um, and uh, everything we were doing. We'll move on to item six, uh, approving an on-bill credit of $100 for CARE and FARA customers. Uh, Jan, is this you? Or just Leslie? Uh, this will be Leslie, although I would like to, um, when she is finished, I'd like to just talk about what other CCAs are doing as well, just so you have that information. Okay. Hi. Uh, okay, so uh, just to uh, highlight, I think we're all really familiar with what's going on, but um, you know, the shelter in place, the schools are closed throughout the county. Uh, students are now home, uh, we know until at least May 1. Um, all residents are either ordered to uh, work from home or suspend work if not employed in essential business. Um, and, and really this is impacting uh, a lot of industries, but in particular um, service industries, um, uh, restaurants, small businesses, uh, and care and fair customers are more likely to be employed with some of those industries that are more uh, highly impacted. So less likely to be employed by uh, tech companies doing work from home and more likely to be employed by smaller businesses that are, you know, severely reduced hours or totally shut down right now. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and what does this mean for energy impact for home in the home and residence? Um, the whole family is now home for, uh, you know, approximately 24 hours a day, um, maybe 23 or 22 hours if you're going out for an hour or so to exercise, but um, really pretty much all day, whereas previously um, for 12 to 15 hours a day, people were out of the home, work, school, other activities, um, but otherwise not in the house. Uh, there's uh, definitely an increased load from uh, folks working um, from home, but also for uh, homeschooling activities um, and just in general being in your house rather than having the option to be out doing other um, activities. Uh, the exact impacts are, are difficult to model. We do have a little bit of data, which I'll show you, I uh, showed you a little bit earlier and I have a slide just for residential to show you. Um, but uh, we do just know in general that energy usage is going to go up just by the nature of everyone being home and using things at home rather than um, being out of the house for at least half the day. 
And our, our care and fair customers, um, like we mentioned, are more likely to be impacted with um, job loss right now. Um, they're also less likely to be able to absorb additional, a sudden increase in something like utility costs. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, this, uh, Sarah from our, our procurement team um, helped me out with this uh, uh, graph here where we took a look at um, just a, a Monday to Monday um, this past week, which is the uh, uh, orange graph there on the residential load that we were getting um, from uh, uh, from Calpine versus um, a similar week last year. So similar week in terms of uh, characteristics from last year, you can see definitively um, uh, every day uh, that the residential load is noticeably up um, for customers. Um, essentially, uh, since the shelter in place um, came into play uh, and even uh, even a little bit up on the weekends um, where many people's activities might not be totally different, but um, still right now it's a higher usage that we're seeing than uh, we would otherwise see during a similar week um, this time of the year. Next slide. Uh, so here are, um, we have care and fairer customers um, throughout um, our service territory, um, and they're uh, just showing you folks a distribution in terms of active customers within your territory and how many of those residential customers are also care and fair customers. Um, so you can see we do have them throughout our service territory. Uh, some communities have a higher concentration than others, but providing this assistance would actually um, provide assistance um, everywhere in uh, San Mateo County. Next slide, please. So we're looking to do a um, $100 um, uh, on-bill credit to apply to all active um, care and fair customers as of uh, March 20th. Um, the credit would be applied directly to the customer accounts on their uh, utility bill um, by our billing partner, Calpine, go on the PCE um, page of the bill. I'm not seeing, okay. And, uh, and you know, assuming it's approved tonight, um, the credit can uh, roll out to customers statements starting um, uh, no later than April 10th. And the April 10th there, day there is because that's 10 business days um, from after, assuming that uh, it's approved tonight, there's some time that uh, Calpine needs to, to program and test it, make sure it goes through properly. Um, but uh, they would start, customers would start seeing this credit on their statements that are generated um, after uh, April 10th. And then um, as of last Friday, when we uh, pulled this list, uh, there's a little over 30,000 um, customers um, enrolled. Um, so this is a little over $3 million uh, in total um, uh, grant that we're looking at for uh, customers here. Um, so the uh, $100 um, uh, on, uh, on bill credit um, is what we're proposing. The way we're, the reason we're suggesting an on bill credit versus another method like sending out checks to people um, is this is the, um, easiest and fastest way to make sure that everybody who's eligible for the credit gets the funds quickly. Um, we know that we can um, turn this on with Calpine, have it apply to everyone's account and everyone who's eligible gets it versus sending checks out to people, having to you know, deal with lost mail, um, delay in mail, um, and the fact that not everyone maybe has access to um, mobile banking opportunities and whatnot and not wanting to encourage people to have to leave their home to, uh, you know, deposit a check to get the credit. Um, uh, the way that this credit will be applied, it will go to Peninsula Clean Energy Generation charges first. Um, and if there's any excess, it would roll through to the remaining pg e charges. Um, uh, this is a process that has uh, been set up between uh, pg e and uh, the CCAs to ensure that credits flow both ways um, uh, between uh, the, the entities. We actually were having a problem uh, a while ago where credits on the pg e side of the bill were not flowing through to CCA customers. They had to clean this up um, primarily in anticipation of the 
um, COU transition and um, looking forward to bill protection and having all of those um, potential charges flow correctly back and forth. Um, we do know that uh, according to both PG&E and Calpine, this is the way that this is expected to work, but I just want to preface, there's not been a large scale test of this process yet. Um, this is the first time it's happening uh, where a CCA is going to push through a large, a large credit like this um, to customers. Um, but um, all, all indications are that this is how it's going to work, this is how it's supposed to work. Um, but uh, just a little, you know, anecdote, the average PCE charges for care and fair customers in February last month um, was uh, 30, $35, uh, just under $35. So this credit will likely cover increases in PCE charges over this past um, month where people are home, um, plus then flow through and cover some of the additional um, increases that customers would be seeing on the PG&E side of the bill. So it's going to provide um, uh, a good amount of, of relief for everybody who um, is eligible. Next slide. Uh, we're gonna notify customers in multiple ways um, that this credit is coming. Um, we have a, a letter, a marketing team has drafted a letter um, that will be uh, heading to our printer um, uh, tomorrow, assuming uh, this is approved. Um, there's also an email that's going to be going out to customers that we have email addresses for. Um, we're doing a blog post and then an article in the um, customer newsletter uh, as well. And a press release is set to go out um, tomorrow, uh, again, pending uh, board approval of the resolution. A um, couple things I wanted to just highlight or note here for, for consideration for the board. Um, uh, you know, right now we wanted to move forward with this quickly and, and get something in place for customers right away because we know people are, um, you know, already hurting um, financially. Um, uh, the best way for us to identify people that are already sort of in need um, of funds or might be more at risk is to use an identifier like already enrolled in a, in a program like Carafera. Um, so we took a list, you know, of active customers now, um, but the enrollments in Care and Fair programs are likely to increase over the coming weeks um, as more um, families and individuals start to look for assistance and start to apply for ways to um, help uh, in the coming weeks. So the, you know, the board, um, uh, might want to consider uh, if we want to, you know, amend the, the resolution that we have in place, or we can come back at a future meeting and take a look at increased enrollment um, in Karen Farah and uh, consider um, a credit for, for new customers as well. And if that's all I had right now. I think Jan wanted to add some comments. Go ahead, Jen. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted, you know, I'm totally uh, behind what we're um, proposing, of course. I just wanted to let you know what other CCAs are doing. And uh, we did have a call today with the other, some CCAs uh, here in the Bay Area. So, uh, and they're all in different financial situations. And we are, fortunately, we can afford to do this. And I know the board has discussed this before, how could we, provide more um, benefits to our customers. And this is certainly an important way for us to do it. So just that, so that you know, um, San Jose Clean Energy is going to be asking uh, their commercial customers who are paying less for electricity right now uh, because their load has gone down as, as you saw um, those graphs I showed you at the very beginning. So there's a group called Silicon Valley Strong that San Jose has, has um, put together and they're going to be asking commercial customers to contribute to that um, entity. So we similarly have San Mateo Strong, certainly we could reach out to our commercial customers or, um, or other, uh, others of you who are leaders here in San Mateo County could talk to your um, businesses, um, large businesses who are doing okay and see if they want to contribute to San Mateo Strong. For Monterey Bay Community Power, they are looking at reducing their May and June bills for all customers by half, but then collecting that later on in the year. 
and they have a very different kind of customer base than we do. They have a very heavy agricultural base, and um, so that's what they're planning to do. East Bay is planning to reduce their expenditures for their programs by one and a half to two million dollars and giving half of that money to cities to use for their own programs, some to health systems like Kaiser and Sutter, and some to the food banks. And then Silicon Valley Clean Energy is thinking of reducing their rate discount. Currently, they're offering a 4% rate discount. They're thinking of actually increasing their customer bills and only offering a 1% rate discount, but then using that money to fund other programs to help people in the community. So everyone's doing something different. We're all certainly thinking about it. Um, I think what, what we're proposing here is something very direct that can help our most um, needy customers uh, very quickly. Thank you, Leslie and Jan. Does anyone have any questions on this item? Uh, I'm looking for hands up. Uh, Larry's got his hand up. Go ahead, Larry. Um, I was going to highly recommend, let me get my picture on, um, that as part of this program, we encourage people who don't want the or, or who are receiving this to, to contribute to San Mateo Strong. Um, I know in our town we've done this before when there's been a, uh, a nominal tax rebate given and everyone was encouraged to give to a charitable foundation. And the amount of money that was contributed turned out to be quite large in the aggregate. So if there's a way we can encourage that in the entire process, I would, uh, I would hope we do so. And not just the uh, business customers, but the individual customers as well. Thank you. Um, other questions or comments from the board? I'd like to make a motion to approve Wayne Lee. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Was that Harvey? Yeah. Yeah, it was Rod. Yeah, was a... Oh, it was Rod. It was Rod, Rod seconded. Rod, Rod does my well seconded. Um, hey, Jeff, this is, this is Andy. Um, somebody wrote a chat that I copied to you. Just want to make sure. I think it's. Oh, okay. Um, I think it might be. I'm not sure it says Rick, but I'm not sure who. Oh, okay. So the, the question is, if, if we give our customers $100 and their PCE charge is 35, then the other 65 could be going towards the PG&E portion of their bill? Or does it just go against the PCE portion of the bill? It, it flows through against any other charges that are on that bill. So it, it would end up offsetting additional, um, you know, charges from, from PG&E. I think, you know, most customers, when they get their bill, they don't actually think about like how much of it is PCE and how much of it is PG&E. It, it's just my whole bill, right? And I pay one check. Um, so um, uh, it, it technically would go through and cover other charges that are not PCE charges, um, but it would provide, you know, that level of relief to customers. And if there was a credit, like if the total customer bill was less than $100, then that additional credit would stay on the account and roll forward to um, the next month's uh, charges. So if the total customer bill was like $60 for some reason, um, uh, the remaining $40 would stay on their account with PG&E and would offset charges the next month. But all customers would get a full $100 of total utility benefits, essentially. Okay, okay. Um, is there, um, is there any, uh, public comment on this item? I don't see any other hands up or comments from the board. Uh, is there any public comment on this item? And does anyone, uh, calling on the phone who can't raise hands care to comment or ask questions? Okay, seeing and hearing none, then I think we are ready to vote on the motion of, of approving this. Jeff, I'm uh, sorry, I've got my hand oh, up. Oh, there, there you are. Okay, sorry, Kat. Sure. 
Um, may sound funny, but I just want to make sure um, that we are going to make it really clear that this uh, uh, aid that we're doing does come from Peninsula Clean Energy. How are we going to communicate that? Because as you uh, said, well, on the billet, yeah, the on the bill itself, it will be on our page, and it'll, it'll be a line item, you know, credit yeah, on our page. Yeah, my husband doesn't know the difference between the two pages. That's why I'm saying, how are we going to make it clear? That's a good point. Right. So it, it, on the bill, on our part of the bill, we're also sending a letter, a direct mail letter to everyone who's receiving this and everyone who we have an email for, um, which isn't all the customers, but everyone had, that we have an email for is also going to get an email um, that they're getting this. We're also doing a, you know, pending approval, a general press release tomorrow, um, along with a follow-up uh, blog post and an article in our, our customer newsletter. Just so as a, like five channels of communication. Just as a suggestion, it would be great if you could send us like a suggested little blog that even we could put up on, uh, whether it's on our Facebook page or however we use our social media uh, to promote that as well. Sure, I, I, I'm sure like Katie will get one prepped for you. <laughs> great, thank you. Thanks, Kat. Uh, Wayne has his hand up, go ahead, Wayne. Yeah, um, thanks, Kat and uh, Leslie. I, I also, maybe um, you can put something on, I don't know, maybe Sam Cedar's site, Sam Mateo oh. County Strong. Or are you going to do that? You already did that? No, sorry. And I'm sorry, we're, KJ reminded me, we're also doing a post on Nextdoor. We have a, uh, next, we have a Nextdoor account now that we can do some PSA annou announcements, and so it'll also be up on our, on our Nextdoor. Yeah, I, I agree with the sentiment that we should we should broadcast it as widely as we can. Are there other other uh, there are the board comments? Yes, uh, Jeff Rick Degolia had a comment. Yeah, he he was un he was muted, but I think he's unmuted now. Rick, Rick, you there? Uh, yeah, I'm here. I was just trying to unmute my phone so I could vote on it. There isn't any instruction about how you do that, but I'm good now. Okay. Thanks. Um, so I'll just just one last time, I'll call. Is there any public uh, board or public comment on on the item? Uh, Wayne, your hand's still up, but I'm assuming that you've you're, you've said your piece. Okay. Um, Seeing no more comments or questions, we can do a roll call vote on this. Uh, Anne, can you start? All right. So this is the uh, the vote on item six, the CARE Fera uh, credit. If you would please announce your name and a yes or no when I announce the jurisdiction. County of San Mateo. Uh, County of San Mateo. Town of Atherton. Rick DeGolia, yes. City of Belmont. Julia Mate, yes. City of Brisbane. Madison Davis, yes. City of Burlingame. Donna Colson, yes. Town of Colma. John Goodwin, yes. City of Daly City. Rod Dosnagwal, yes. City of East Palo Alto. City of Foster City. Catherine Mahampur, yes. City of Half Moon Bay. All right, I did not hear Harvey on that. Uh, town of Hillsborough. Larry May, yes. City of Menlo Park. Catherine Carlton, yes. City of Millbrae. Wayne Lee, yes. City of Pacifica. Deirdre Martin, yes. Town of Portola Valley. Jeff Alfs, yes. City of Redwood City. Ian Bain, yes. City of San Bruno. I did not hear Marty there. Marty City Bedina, of San Carlos. Yes. Oh, okay. I heard a yes Thank from you, Marty. Thank you, Marty. I got you. Thank you. City of San Carlos. Laura Palmer-Lohan, yes. City of San Mateo. 
Rick Bonilla, yes. City of South San Francisco. Laura Nicholas, yes. Town of Woodside. I hear static. I hear scrambling. Daniel Yost, yes. Thank you, Daniel. The motion passes unanimously. Okay, thank you all. We will thank move you. on then to item seven, which is the approval of a second investment manager. Uh, Andy, do you wanna lead off on this? Sure. Um, uh, uh, the, I'll be hopefully brief. Donna gave a summary. Um, I'll put my video on too, if that helps. Um, PC currently has uh, uh, basically four uh, accounts that hold cash. Uh, we have an account with Wilmington Trust, uh, where our inflows from PG&E flow on a daily basis. Uh, we have an operating account with First Republic Bank um, that uh, serves as our primary account for uh, all ongoing operations. Uh, and we have a bank, First Republic Bank savings account that is where uh, the lockbox funds are transferred uh, kind of as an intermediary for us to hold um, funds that we don't need on a daily basis. Um, and then we also have an investment account with First Republic Bank uh, that has managed uh, the large, largest portion now of our reserves and uh, um, where, we, where we used to earn some interest in, in the current world, probably don't earn very much um, because we're investing in pretty safe and probably low interest bearing accounts. Um, the, um, uh, the First Republic Bank investment account was initially funded in April 2018 with $40 million and it's grown now to 160 million uh, as of the end of February. Uh, the Audit and Finance Committee uh, directed staff uh, to look at a second, uh, adding a second investment manager to diversify funds um, and not be held in, all, in one account. Um, we, on December 20th uh, of last year, issued an RFP um, uh, and uh, that RFP submittal date was February 7th. Uh, we had seven firms express interest and six uh, submitted proposals, as Donna mentioned. Um, uh, we, uh, the, the committee conducted a detailed review of proposals with Larry May and Donna Colson. Uh, they determined that PFM asset management was, uh, as John Donna um, uh, said, was uniquely qualified to provide the services the PCE needed. Um, and on March 9th at an audit finance committee, meeting uh, with the full committee there, um, the uh, PFM presented its uh, sum summary proposal and findings and, we, and the, um, the committee had a chance to uh, interview them. Um, as of that meeting, the committee also recommended uh, retaining PFM to uh, uh, manage uh, uh, 40 to 60%, basically half of the funds um, uh, that we have as excess. So at this point, that would be roughly 80 million, but a range of that. Um, a little bit of about PFM. Um, they started in 1989. They are almost 100% uh, dedicated to serving public agencies, some of which are uh, uh, agencies that you are council members of. Um, 170 clients in California. Um, they have a San Francisco based account team that we met with uh, the key account manager that we would work with also works with the cities of Millbrae, Burlingame and San Mateo. Um, and PFM uh, also provides investment management services to the county of San Mateo, managing uh, about $5 billion of the county's $5.8 billion total portfolio. Um, uh, and I, I contacted uh, um, I had uh, reference calls with uh, three of these uh, play, uh, places, which is um, Burlingame, Redwood City, and uh, County of San Mateo. Uh, our recommendation is that we retain uh, PFM asset management as a second investment manager to initially manage 40 to 60% um, of PCC, uh, PC's investment funds and to direct the treasurer, um, by the way, that's me, to execute any documents necessary to establish accounts relationship and management. That's the uh, 
res resolution uh, recommendation. Um, the reason for the range of 40 to 60 percent, um, we're targeting 50 percent, but um, we uh, uh, it, the number fluctuates a little bit, so we just wanted to allow a little bit of a range, um, and also um, because it won't be an exact number, and also the ability to depending on um, what investments we're holding and whether they mature in the in 30 days or 40 days. Um, the percentage range might uh, might fluctuate a little bit as well. Uh, so that's all uh, that I had. If there are, uh, I'll take questions if you have them. Okay, uh, I see Rick has his hand up. Uh, go ahead, Rick Degolia. Sorry, it sounds like a good proposal to me. I'd move approval. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Who was that? Larry. Okay. Um, any other board questions on this report? Okay. Is there any public comment on this? Okay. I don't see any hands up. If there's anyone on the phone who wants to comment, uh, you can unmute and, and, and ask now. Okay, uh, I just, I wanna thank uh, Andy and the Audit and Finance Committee. They, they've, they put a lot of work into this and I, I, I was in one of the interview with PFM. I agree they're a, a well-qualified firm. So thank you all for the work on this. And if there are no other comments, we can do we can do a roll call vote on this, Sam. Okay. All right. If uh, this is for item number seven, if you would please announce your name and a yes or no when I announce the jurisdiction. County of San Mateo. County of San Mateo. Town of Atherton. Rick Degolia, yes. City of Belmont. Julia Mate, yes. City of Brisbane. Madison Davis, yes. City of Burlingame. Donna Colson, yes. Town of Colma. John Goodwin, yes. City of Daly City. Rod Dosnagwell, yes. City of East Palo Alto. City of Foster City. Catherine Mahampur, yes. City of Half Moon Bay. Town of Hillsboro. Larry May, yes. City of Menlo Park. Uh, Catherine Carlton, yes. Thank you, Catherine. City of Millbrae. Wayne Lee, yes. City of Pacifica. Deirdre Martin, yes. Town of Portola Valley. Jeff Alves, yes. City of Redwood City. Ian Bain, yes. City of San Bruno. Marty Medina, yes. City of San Carlos. Laura Palmer Lohan, yes. City of San Mateo. Rick Bonilla, yes. City of South San Francisco. Flory Nicholas, yes. Town of Woodside. Daniel Yost, yes. Thank you, the motion passes unanimously. Great, thank you all. That brings us to item eight, which is approval of a uh, lift EV contract. Um, thank um, you. Um, Jeff and all, can uh, you all hear me? Okay. This is Rafael Reyes. Okay, yes. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, uh, board members, uh, for the opportunity to present here. Uh, we have for your consideration what we consider to be a particularly exciting uh, and unique opportunity. Uh, what we are proposing here is a prospective pilot with uh, Lyft, the ride hailing service. Uh, as and I'll discuss here, um, it's a particularly high impact opportunity, both uh, from an economic standpoint and a greenhouse gas standpoint. And the specific request is to approve the pilot and authorize Jan to enter an agreement 
with FlexDrive, which is a Lyft rent vehicle rental partner. Uh, and the amount requested here is for $500,000. Next slide, please. As a quick recap on the emissions picture, um, most of you have seen this before, uh, but uh, transportation and equipment accounts for over 60% of our greenhouse gases uh, in the uh, county. This is a 2015 emissions inventory. If you click next, um, Andy, please. Uh, and of course, the electricity side has already been cut substantially by virtue of PCE's cleaner electricity. Uh, the one other flag uh, I would just make as background on this emissions inventory is it does not include air travel, which is known to be a large emissions source. And also natural gas is substantially understated because it does not factor uh, leaks, which account for a considerable additional amount of emissions. Nevertheless, uh, transportation is still the majority of emissions in the county. Next slide, please. As additional background on transportation, uh, Philip Kobernick on our team, program manager on our team, has been doing further analysis on the transportation uh, segments. And uh, with, uh, in this particular pie, I just want to call out a couple elements. The dark blue and the dark green are personal vehicles. And as you can see, they account for a significant uh, majority of the emissions uh, with fleets and then heavy duty comprising the other segments of the, uh, of the transportation picture. Uh, we do know that ride hailing does account for a significant uh, number of miles within that personal vehicle uh, component. And it's estimated that between 100 and 200,000 daily vehicle miles are traveled in San Mateo County um, uh, by ride hailing drivers. Next slide, please. A quick recap of our efforts in transportation. Next. This is a high level view of our road program roadmap. Next, please. Personal vehicles, as you may recall, we have a number of initiatives already underway. We have the Ride and Drive campaign to build awareness around the vehicles. Uh, naturally, in the current uh, conditions uh, with the COVID crisis, we are not running events, um, but we do hope to restart them later on when the shelter in place is lifted. Uh, we have a new vehicle uh, program, which has been running quarterly. Um, however, we are now uh, reevaluating that program and may look to bring adjustments to that program uh, in the coming weeks, uh, coming uh, uh, months. Um, we have an ongoing low income electric vehicle program, the Drive Forward program, which is continuing. Uh, and then, of course, the EV infrastructure incentive program, which we're, we'll be bringing up later on this year. Next. Another number of additional elements that are in the program roadmap, uh, pilot projects that are underway around smart charging, low power charging, which we've discussed previously, and then a number of forthcoming elements, one of which is the transportation network companies uh, um, element. And this pilot is intended to be the first step in that uh, component. Next slide, please. So um, here are the specifics uh, for this particular program. Um, one of the big issues with ride hailing is the significant uh, emissions that uh, are coming from this particular use case. Uh, next. And uh, here is one particular element of the analysis. Um, currently, it's estimated that, uh, that uh, ride hailing vehicles account for two to three times the impact of personal autos. Um, and uh, as we can see here, there's in fact more uh, emissions on a uh, per mile uh, or per trip basis uh, because there are extra miles actually being driven. Uh, but electric vehicles, um, the green bar here, um, show uh, lower emissions, both from the um, dis what would have been the displaced personal vehicle as well as the ride hailing uh, uh, trip. So significant emissions uh, reduction opportunity. Uh, and uh, much of this is happening, uh, much of the charging associated with this is happening at DC uh, fast charging. 
um, which is also an interesting factor. And in that, in particular, it's happening during the daytime and uh, is likely to be primarily complementary to our load shaping objectives. Next slide. So we have specific goals here around this pilot. One is to create a high visibility demonstration. Uh, there are other demonstrations like this happening nationally, but none in California. Next. We of course want to reduce emissions. Next. And this is a particularly important one in the context of the recession that we're now stepping into. And that is that many uh, of the ride hailing drivers are low income um, or otherwise underserved. We don't yet have specific data on this, but we do believe that it's a, a very significant uh, percentage. Uh, and we are looking at executing an NDA with, uh, with Lyft um, to get more data in advance of the pilot. But part of the agreement would be to also get additional data on both the uh, drivers and the kind of driving that they're doing. Next. Uh, this pilot uh, would look to, we would use the pilot to assess how we would scale up for a full scale pilot with the intention of electrifying the entirety of ride hailing that's happening within the county. Next. And then finally, we wanna leverage this opportunity to build electric vehicle awareness, both among passengers and drivers. And there are a variety of means to doing that, uh, including in vehicle uh, collateral. So passengers would be aware of the fact that it's an electric vehicle, uh, would be aware of Peninsula Clean Energy's role um, and the various benefits, uh, as well as of course, driver training. And finally, there is the potential that Lyft would, could enable what's known as green mode which would allow ride hailing um, passengers to specifically request electric vehicles. And that's one element that we would have to assess in the course of the pilot. Next slide. So the uh, targets for the, the proposed targets for the pilot include 100 vehicles uh, for 100 ride shared drivers. Now this of course, over the time frame that we're talking about 12 to 15 months, um, there may be many drivers uh, uh, using those, those vehicles because those vehicles would be turning over through a, a lease program or a rental program. Uh, we would be gathering a specific utilization and charging data. And then finally, we would, uh, as I noted earlier, um, use this to evaluate uh, how to scale this up to, uh, to all ride hailing uh, vehicles across the county. We anticipate for the pilot um, that we would see savings of over 200,000 total gallons of gasoline, uh, approximately 2,000 2, tons of greenhouse gas avoided, and somewhere on the order of $750,000 in combined savings to the ride hailing drivers. So this is a substantial economic opportunity for the drivers themselves due to lower fueling costs and lower maintenance costs. Next slide. Here's the program model. Uh, and I should note, by the way, we do have available here in the meeting, uh, representative from Lyft, uh, John Walker, the uh, sustainability manager with Lyft. And so he'll be available if there are questions uh, from the board specifically for Lyft. Um, but let me speak to, I'm sorry, back one slide. Let me speak to how the uh, program would work. Um, so there are several elements here. Um, uh, on the top, obviously, is Lyft. Um, Lyft would be providing data to Peninsula Clean Energy. Uh, second, uh, moving left, uh, marketing to drivers about the vehicles and the opportunities to use them. And those, that marketing would be targeted, um, particularly targeting uh, large, high utilization drivers. So they're driving a lot of miles. And they are also funding charging for the drivers. So the drivers can access the charging for free at EVgo or Electrify America chargers. Um, looking down from the bottom, Lyft uh, has a partnership with a company called Flex Drive, which rents vehicles to drivers. Um, this is often an uh, economical option for drivers. In many cases, they may not own their own vehicles or 
um, it's less expensive than having to maintain their own vehicles because of the high costs of brake jobs, oil, and other maintenance requirements. Uh, and uh, so FlexDrive rents the vehicles to drivers. And what we would be providing is vouchers that, um, uh, to the drivers from FlexDrive um, to lower the cost of the vehicles to uh, equal or less than the gasoline equivalent um, types of vehicles. Uh, we in turn would then fund those vouchers. And so the incentive would be recruited by FlexDrive to help uh, lower the cost of having acquired those vehicles. But this particular structure incentivizes Flex drive and lift to maximize the utilization of the vehicles and it ensures that the benefits go to the drivers themselves. Next slide. Here's a perspective timeline. Uh, so, we of course have uh, here in March the proposal before you. We would then enter into contracting with Flex Drive uh, in, over the next couple of months. Uh, and uh, then on to vehicle acquisition in late spring and uh, early summer uh, with the intention of launching midsummer and then evaluating the program next year. Next slide. So again, the request is up to uh, $500,000 for this uh, pilot program with uh, FlexDrive uh, Lyft's partner and to authorize Jan to execute that agreement or refine and execute that agreement. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Raphael. Um, I see Ian's got his hand up. Uh, Ian, why don't you go ahead and start? Yeah, this is excellent, Raphael. I love this, this idea and I really hope it's super successful. I can already think of uh, if you enabled the feature on being able to rec request the electric vehicles, I can think of several people who would take advantage of that. Um, my question was about uh, the benefits that you listed, including the reduced GAGs, et cetera. Over what period of time are those benefits? This is 12 to 15 months. Got it. Thank you. Are there other questions from the board? If yes, not, Rick Bonilla. Uh, go ahead, Rick. A um, couple of things. Um, I'm wondering, have we considered offering uh, a similar proposal to, uh, for instance, uh, taxi cab companies who are also running lots of cars out there, usually bigger, dirtier cars? Yeah, and that's, uh, that's a fair question. It is something that we have given uh, some thought to and uh, is something that uh, we would like to look at. Um, the, uh, the model is very different. Uh, most taxi companies, uh, at least that we're aware of, um, own their own vehicles uh, and then uh, uh, you know, have employees obviously who are driving those and obviously they're particularly impacted by the competitive dynamic um, here with ride hailing. Uh, that would likely necessitate um, having some infrastructure, um, uh, but uh, or possibly um, training them to use uh, fast chargers. So I, I think there is some opportunity there. I um, uh, I frequent uh, a local taxi service uh, here in San Mateo called Luxor Cabs, and uh, had uh, every time we take them to the airport. Uh, we always ask, you know, how things are going and how the business is going. And unfortunately, there's been a dramatic decline in number of vehicles. Um, there may not be that many taxi services actually resident in San Mateo County with many vehicles. Um, so Luxor is one example. It used to have some 20 vehicles a few years back, and now they're down to seven vehicles. Um, last time I spoke with a driver there. So um, there may be an opportunity. Um, Again, it may not be very large in San, in San Mateo County, but we can certainly explore that. Uh, thanks. I have a follow-up question. Um, looking at the chosen partner, in this case, Lyft, um, I have a concern that uh, because of state law, uh, Assembly Bill 5 from last year, their business model is under dire threat. Um, in fact, 
they are refusing to come in compliance with labor law. And uh, I have personally a big issue because they now have people that have been working with them for some years. And as we're going through this difficult crisis right now, those people who chose to work um, without traditional labor protections, whether they knew that or not, I don't know. But uh, those people are having no access to unemployment now, except not through the state, but the federal government is offering them perhaps some help. But they're not accruing security, Medicare, unemployment, workers' comp, state disability insurance. These people are, are scraping along the edge and it just really rips my heart out to think that we're gonna partner with this company, which because of their refusal to comply with not only the new law, but their whole business model, even before this new law came into effect, was actually in violation of the independent contractor law. So, I, I mean, I know it's a rant, but my opinion is they owe all those workers back pay for all those benefits they refused to pay for. And uh, I'm gonna have to vote no on this just because of the partner. I think it's a great idea, but I'd like to find some other partner to do it with. Thanks. Thank you, and, and certainly um, uh, there's there's a lot of uh, you know concern uh, in, in, with regards to the business models. Um, one of the essential elements of this program is ensuring that the drivers are benefiting, and uh, uh, one of the reasons that we feel that there is still value there is that uh, is that Lyft is not the beneficiary there, but it's the drivers. Uh, and they're under right. enormous economic pressure, as you noted. Uh, and so that may be something for, um, for board members to consider in this. Thank you. Okay, I see uh, Catherine has her hand up and then Wayne. Hi, I'm assuming you, it's me, Catherine Mahampur? Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I have the same concern about Lyft and uh, AB5. I've actually been doing some research on AB5 for a client. So uh, I am concerned about that the same as um, Rick uh, Bonilla. My other question is, um, do we have any data on with the COVID-19? I know traffic has decreased enormously. So do we have any data as to how much it's decreased? So um, we... Uh, we do know just from some uh, uh, general comments that Lyft has offered that they're at the moment with the shelter in place has been a dramatic decline. Uh, we also know that, that uh, a big part of that is uh, transportation to and from the airport. And since there are not people flying, um, that's a major factor. Uh, we anticipate that at some point the shelter in place will be lifted and tra uh, transportation uh, excuse me, travel will, will go back up. Um, it's entirely possible that demand for ride hailing might actually go up in the recession um, to some degree. Um, it's, it's a little hard to tell, frankly, um, uh, but there are m many factors that might influence the total amount, but certainly it will uh, at least substantially recover after the shelter in place is lifted. At least that's our expectation. Um, I'm just wondering if it might be worth it to delay it, to delay the program. Uh, and, you know, certainly that uh, may be something that, you know, the board may wish to discuss. Um, one of the factors to consider is, uh, is we have an opportunity to be an, a first mover in California on um, what would be a particularly strategic opportunity. Um, there are other agencies in California that are actively looking at developing similar kinds of programs. Uh, and it would be an opportunity to both showcase the solutions and scale those solutions more quickly in San Mateo County if we move more quickly. Um, uh, and of course, if, if we defer it, we might still be able to do the program, um, although we may defer some of the benefits, including the, uh, the initial visibility that would come from being the first mover in the state. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Wayne. Uh, yeah, um, it's a good, uh, good point, uh, Rick. And also, I just uh, I just got the chance to ride in the EV uh, lift vehicle, 
And the person who was using, he was renting the car. Um, so I think if you, if you rolled it out in July, I'm pretty sure uh, the virus will kind of um, slow down by then. And I'm pretty sure rideshare people would, uh, would be trying to take advantage of, um, you know, trying to make up some lost time. And, and a rebate would be, some sort of rebate would be very helpful in them recovering their, their, um, in, um, recovering their lost wages. Mm -hmm. Okay. One of the other elements, if I might add, is that we will be exploring opportunities to bridge the drivers into personal EVs in some form. There will be an end of life for these vehicles in the rental companies, and that might open up our opportunities to drivers who may want to own their own vehicles to then buy these now used uh, electric vehicles. Um, so this is still a point of exploration. Uh, uh, and uh, as we know, there's substantially less maintenance and likely much longer lifespan to electric vehicles and lower ongoing costs. Uh, so uh, there's another follow-on opportunity uh, for potential ownership um, by the drivers, but this is still uh, something that we would need to explore further. Okay, Donna has her hand up next. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, I actually think this is a very thoughtful program that our staff has come up with. Um, I'm not as concerned about the AB5 because this is supporting directly the drivers and the, um, the car, you know, the, the, the individuals that are, um, you know, renting the cars or, or acquiring the cars, as opposed to supporting Lyft, the Lyft organization. Um, it's really not the writer's fault that, I mean, the driver's fault. Lyft has to work out their AB5 issues and the drivers need jobs and they're going to drive. And I think it's actually a really optimal time to roll it out when the demand is a little lower and we can work the bugs out of it. And then as demand ramps up through the summer, we'll be in a much better position to make sure that the efficacy of the program is solid. Um, so I just, I think it's a creative and innovative way to really significantly lower the greenhouse gases. I'm the one, one of the people who would always call this service. So I would be in support of this. Okay, thank you, Donna. Uh, I, Laura has her hand up. Thank you, Jeff. Um, you, uh, you'd mentioned uh, that there was a representative from Lyft here with us this evening. Is that yes. is, and I'm, I'm just wondering if they could maybe speak to this AB5 issue and what the company's stance is on ensuring a fair and livable wage for their drivers. Yeah, hey, this is John from Lyft. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, go ahead, John. Yeah, so I'm, I'm on the sustainability team. I'd be happy to direct any of the, the labor conversations offline with anyone that wants to. Um, but I do agree with the previous point that whatever, you know, whatever you all think of Lyft or Lyft's business model or however it relates to AB5, that uh, the way that staff has created this is very, very good in our view that the money is flowing to the driver. And what we're doing is we are providing the charging and the, the, the data. So really we are, we're, we're additive to the system and the, the funding is flowing away from us. But, so I think um, I would definitely agree with, with Donna's points that um, the way it's set up is very, is very clever so that you don't really have to, to worry about your, maybe your personal feelings about a business model. Uh, thank you, John. Um, are there any, any more board questions about this? Including from the phone, yes. Okay, uh, if there are no more board comments right now, I, uh, Mark, I see your hand up, go ahead. Okay, all right. Um, there's a couple things. One is the the idea that it might be good to split the funding in part to Luxor since they're utilizing the cars 24-7, it sounds like. Um, but the other bigger consideration is that um, I know somebody who works for Lyft and Uber, 
and who has been able to earn $45 a couple days uh, by getting four or five rides. And today said that he'd earned, um, well, he didn't say what he earned. He said he had one ride in four hours out on there. Nobody's traveling um, and nobody's going to the airport. And it's just really, really tough. And um, until and and in terms of when we think this thing will be over, um, there there's a chance that we can intercept the explosion that's about to happen um, because some companies like Tesla and General Motors are building respirators and stuff. But what you really can expect is that the uh, the the Town, the, the pandemic is happening in towns all over and cities all over America now. It's not just so like New York was the leader, but the, the situation in New York is likely to be the situation in much of the country. And that means that it'll probably be later than July before things are really back to normal. The other thing that's necessary to get back to normal is a very good diagnostic test that's fast, accurate, and inexpensive. And a computer base of who's who's negative, who's positive. Without that, the public health management can't be done, and we're going to wind up being cocooned for a whole lot longer than we think. Yeah, I I, I completely share that concern about the timing of it. Uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, is there any other public comment on on the item? Okay. I don't see any other hands up. Is there anyone calling in from the public who would like to comment? Okay, I don't hear anyone. Um, I'd like to make a motion to approve. Is that Wayne? Yes. Is there a second? Ian Bain, second. Thank you. Uh, is there any more discussion on this item? Okay, hearing none, uh, we have a motion seconded. Uh, we can take a roll call vote. All right, this is the vote on item eight for the EV lift <coughs> contract. If you would please announce your name and a yes or a no after I announce the jurisdiction. County of San Mateo. County of San Mateo. Town of Atherton. Uh, this is Rick DeGolia, I'll vote yes. City of Belmont. Julia Mates, yes. City of Brisbane. Addison Davis, yes. City of Burlingame. Donna Colson, yes. Town of Colma. John Goodwin, yes. City of Daly City. Rod Das Magwell, no. City of East Palo Alto. Um, Carlos Romero, I'll abstain. I just joined about five minutes ago. I'm sorry. City of Foster City. Catherine Mahampur, no. City of Half Moon Bay. Alvin Warbeck, yes. Town of Hillsboro. Larry May, yes. City of Menlo Park. City of Menlo Park. City of Millbrae. Wayne Lee, yes. City of Pacifica. Deirdre Martin, yes. Town of Portola Valley. Jeff Alfs, yes. City of Redwood City. Ian Bain, yes. City of San Bruno. Marty Medina, yes. City of San Carlos. Laura Palmer Lohan, yes. City of San Mateo. Rick Bonilla, no. City of South San Francisco. Laura Nicholas, yes. Town of Woodside. Daniel Yost abstaining only because my employer does work with Lyft, but uh, applaud the program. 
Okay, uh, I just did a count. The motion does pass uh, with two abstentions and three no's. The remainder, yeses, and the motion passes. Thank you. Okay, um, we'll move on then to item nine, which is a review of the strategic plan. Uh, Jan? Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to tag team this slightly with, with Donna. So yes, if we could go to the first slide there. So as you recall, you all had a retreat in January on our strategic plan. In March, earlier this month, the strategic plan draft was uh, reviewed by the board strategic planning subcommittee. Um, it has been sent out to you and it's in your packet. And tonight, what we would like to do is review the mission, vision, and organizational priorities and provide direction on those things. And then in April, we will bring that back to you um, and to approve the full strategic plan. And then in May, we will implement and develop the work plans that go along with this uh, for staff. So um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, we're asking for your direction tonight on the mission statement, the vision statement, and organizational priority one in terms of the definition of carbon free. So Donna will lead the discussion on the mission statement and the vision statement, and I will lead the discussion on the um, organizational priority one. So. Okay, Hold on this, here for, this, Seth, for Donna. this is Good. Donna, yeah. Um, because I'm not controlling the, uh, the you know, audio visual on this, and I believe Jeff is, Jeff, I'm going to have to work with you on this, so you'll, we'll make the commentary, and then you can go ahead and take the, um, the, the directives and questions from the audience, if that's okay, from the board. Um. Actually, Andy's Andy's running the 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 the, uh, the meeting itself, so uh, okay. we'll okay, figure it out. Go ahead. Okay, You'll, you guys will have to do it. You just have to know I can't see who's raising their hand or anything. So, so um, we were able to really work with staff to create this uh, document that's sort of the baseline for the new strategic plan. Um, we really felt that two of the biggest areas where we needed board input were on the mission and the vision statement. I'll go through them both and then maybe we'll just take um, mission first, which um, then will feed into a good vision statement. And I do want to um, really commend the staff for a lot of meetings and time spent hashing over the work we did at the retreat to come up with these three options, all of which are frankly very acceptable to the strategic um, planning subcommittee. but. We just wanted to give everyone a chance for input here. So um, under the first, we have um, the three options, A, B, and C. I'm not gonna read them. You are perfectly capable of reading what's on the page there. I will note, however, that option C was um, the one that was recommended by the staff, uh, recommended by the staff. And um, I think the best way to proceed is to you know, kind of allow everyone an opportunity to weigh in. I'm, as the sort of chair of strategic plan planning, I will have to say, and maybe I can just lead this off, that I did really like option C because it's some, it's pithy, it's um, to the point, easy to understand, and captures, I think, a lot of the um, elements that we were all focused on during the retreat. But with that, I'll open it up to Andy for commentary um, from colleagues. Yeah, does anyone want to start off here? Uh, Ian's got his hand up. Go ahead, Ian. Um, I like B and C. Um, I think they're both really good. I guess I'd probably lean slightly towards C. Anyone else? Thank you, Ian. Anyone else? Uh, Laura's got her hand up. 
Yeah, I was able to make the last committee meeting um, and I do align with option C. I, I agree it's benefit oriented, it's clear and concise. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide comment. Okay, and Daniel's got his hand up. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, yes, I was on the subcommittee as well. Uh, I felt that uh, both staff and our outside consultants did a great job. Uh, it, feel free to look at other sections of this document, but we tried to highlight as a subcommittee the areas where we had some discussion amongst ourselves and differing of opinions. But, uh, you know, I also thought uh, option C was great it's pithy uh, option a is closer to what we had before but it's a lot of information and it is not as uh, pithy as option c so uh, i was comfortable with the staff's recommendation okay uh any other comments from the board on uh, on these these three uh rick's got his hand up thank you so in looking at and thinking about these, I really see objective B as being uh, our core mission, um, something that we really need to focus on because there are big issues with this going forward. I think we're gonna see some more information about this uh, a little farther down the presentation. Objective C looks to me more like a program. Um, it's, it's important, it's something we wanna do. It's part of our plan, we should start doing it. Um, it involves working with local partners. Um, I think most of our cities, if not all, are willing to get involved in this. Um, my focus would mostly be objective B. Okay, thank you. Um, any other comments? Okay, I, do, I don't see any other hands up. Anyone on the phone want to weigh in on this? Okay, oh, uh, sorry, Wayne's got his hand up, go ahead, Wayne. I just wanted to make a motion to uh, approve. Oh, no, not, actually, we're just uh, giving our input, right? This is just direction, there's no action here. I like C, thank you. You like C, okay. Okay, any other comments on the mission statement? Okay, uh, oh, uh, Rod, Rod's got his hand up, good Rod. I'm good with both option C's for both mission and vision. I think the option C for mission is, is very uh, action oriented, it's succinct and um, gets to the point. And then also option C for vision um, echoing everybody else, it's also uh, straight to the point and it's easy to um, digest. If you are seeing the slides, um, uh, the mute button is in the very what of the left hand oh. corner. There you go. Also, make sure your sound is on. Okay. Angie, uh, you're telling everyone how to mute. <laughs> <laughs> so does, um, does staff uh, feel like they have enough guidance on mission? Could we move on to vision? It looks like Catherine has her hand up as oh, well. Great, great. I have to take a phone call now. Yes, hi. Um, uh, for mission, I would go with either B or C. I think both of them are pretty good at explaining what our mission is. Um, for vision, I do like option C. Just my comments. Yeah, and I'll just, I'll say for mission, I agree uh, B and C are both good. Um, and um, as an author of a uh, vision statement. Hey, uh, Jeff, Jeff, C, Jeff so, uh, go ahead. Jeff, um, Kat Carlson is trying to um, on mute and I can do that, but I don't, if I know what her phone number is, does anyone know her phone number? Um, yes, I do. Um, 
If she presses star six on her phone, she can unmute. The last four of her phone number are four, five, two, three. Yay, I finally, that's what I was looking for. I had to give my computer up to my son for him to video conference with his tutor, and I've been trying to unmute for 30 minutes. Thank you. How do I mute myself again? Star six again. Star six again, thank you. Uh, Kat, did you have a comment? No, I was trying to vote on Lyft. I was oh, trying to vote on Got Lyft. it. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, I'm, I'm good with this. Thank you. Okay. So Catherine Mahampur has her hand up. Catherine, go ahead. Actually, I, I just said um, I, I already had my say. <laughs> Mission statement, I'd go for either B or C, oh, and vision okay. statement, I'd go okay. for C. Sorry, I saw your hand up again. No, um, yeah, Marty has his hand up. Go ahead, Marty. Um, C is fine. Okay. Thank you. And Rick. On the vision, I like option B. Uh, option B for vision, okay. And floor. I, I, for mission and vision, I like both option C. Okay. For both. Great. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anybody else on the board want to weigh in on this one? Um, can you guys hear me? This is Madison Davis. Oh, yeah. Hi, Madison. Yes. Hey. Yeah. I am a fan of option C. Okay. Are you talking about mission specifically or both? Uh, mission. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, okay. I can't seem to see um, where it says vision on my screen. I can't see op what option C looks like. Oh, there you go. Is it? Okay. Hey, Jeff, this is your. Sorry, so what? Deirdre Martin. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Deirdre. Uh, for mission, I like C, and for vision, I like C. Great. I think, I think we've got a consensus around C for both, um, and people are some people are okay with B for the mission statement as well. Uh, Wayne, go ahead. I just wanted to thank the committee for uh, the great work. Um, it's very um, succinct and very intelligent. Thank you. Yeah, agreed. Um, uh, Donna, Jan, did you want to move on to, to other parts of the plan right now or? Yeah, I think so. Um, this is Donna, Jan, Jan um, are you satisfied then that you have direction with mission and vision? Yeah, it sounds like we'll go ahead with option C. And put that in for the final to be yeah. approved next month. Okay, then Jan is going to take it over from here uh, and work up out on the definitions around GHG. Thank you. Hey, so we'll go uh, to the next. Hey, Jeff, Jeff, mm -hmm. uh, Julia, yes. Mates won Julia Mates oh, wanted to comment. Sorry, I didn't see you, Julia. And, go ahead, go ahead, Julia. Well. Oh, you're on the her phone. phone might be, her phone might be muted. I'm not sure which one is hers. I see um, her on here on the phone. Oh, uh, here it is. I got it, I got it. Okay, she's unmuted. Go ahead, Julia. Julia? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, uh, you know, it was uh, from, from a past comment. It's, it's fine now. Sorry, it's, it's moved on. Thank you, though. Okay, no, thank you. Okay, I think we're ready to move on to the GHG definitions then. Okay, so Andy, if we can go to the next slide. So we have two key organizational priorities. Priority one is to design a power portfolio that is sourced by 100% carbon-free energy by 2025 that aligns supply and consumer demand on a 24 by seven basis. And uh, that one, we wanted to get clarification from the board on carbon-free energy. And um, so we, the staff has put together a presentation to give a little more 
uh, color to what, what all we're talking about here and what we recommend that definition of carbon free energy in 2025 be. So if we go to the next slide. So we're going to give you some background and um, Siobhan is also on the line, I believe, if we um, need some additional input. So our current goal is to be 100% GHG free by 2021 and to be sourced by 100% California RPS eligible renewable by 2025 on a time coincident basis, provided it is economically viable. So at the retreat, the, the board suggested uh, changing California RPS eligible renewable energy to carbon free. So there is no actual definition of carbon free and we're gonna go through a number of slides as to why that is and, and why we actually recommend that we define carbon free as California RPS eligible. So the next slide. And there was a, um, also a, a um, additional supplement to the board packet that went out today or yesterday, I believe, that um, is kind of our nine page treatise on this. But first of all, we'll just look at our average hourly load uh, by the quarter of the year. And the first quarter is blue, second is red, at least the way I see the colors, uh, third quarter is gray and fourth quarter is yellow. And so it just shows hour by hour that we're pretty consistent across the year, but, but the load does change on an hourly basis. The amount of power, if we're gonna match our supply to our load, for example, in, at 4 a.m., we need less power than how much we, power we need in hour ending 20, which is um, 8 p.m. So this is what we're trying to achieve. We only need about 300 megawatts at 4 a.m. We need 500 megawatts at 8 p.m. Next. So, so we need to contract for power more specifically than we do now to meet that hour by hour load. We, we showed you this slide, uh, I think at our retreat in September, to define what's the difference between renewable energy and greenhouse gas free energy, and to show that not all renewable energy is greenhouse gas free, nor is all greenhouse gas free energy renewable. So renewable is from a source that isn't depleted when it's used and not derived from fossil or nuclear fuel. And GHG free is electricity that doesn't emit carbon or other GHG gases. So resources like solar, wind, and small hydro are Our renewable. Ge geothermal has a small amount of GHG emissions as does biomass, biomass and waste. So if we go on to the next one, and we look at these uh, generation sources in, an, in another way. So we know which ones are renewable and which ones are GHG free as, a po as provided by that definition on our previous slide. And these are the emissions in pounds per megawatt hour associated with the different types of resources. And then we're looking at, can we pre procure these resources in 2025 and beyond, which is where we have our goal? Can we schedule these resources on an hour by hour basis so that we can control how much we get at 4 a.m. versus how much we're getting at 8 p.m., for example. And is there a, the ability to build new resources with this type of technology? As that is also one of our goals in our integrated resource plan. We wanna be responsible for putting more steel in the ground for, for um, increasing the amount of renewable energy that is in the state. <coughs> If we go to the next. So the generation profiles for different resources are, are different. If you look at geothermal, we call that a base load resource. Basically, when you turn it on, it's pretty consistent all of the time. And that's that gray bar on the bottom. Um, can't see this too well. The next one on top of that, which I can't read, I think it says biomass and biogas. Again, those are more kind of like base load resources, they generate all of the time. Small hydro and large hydro as well are also more base load in that 
you know, if, if it has rained and there's water behind the dam for a large hydro resource, then the water can be run through the generator to have a pretty consistent um, amount of power coming out. When you look at wind, uh, that's more intermittent as is the solar PV and solar thermal. So wind typically is higher, produces more electricity in the mornings and the late afternoons. Solar, as you know, produces when the sun is out. And so we have to kind of put a puzzle here together to meet what our hourly needs are from these different resources. Next slide, please. So when we're talking about providing uh, our Eco Plus product at 50% renewable and 95% greenhouse gas free, we figure out how much power are we going to need for the year as a whole, and we um, contract for 50% of that from renewable energy resources, but on an annual basis, not looking at it on an hour by hour basis. So if our annual load is 3,600 gigawatts, gigawatt hours, we purchase 1,800 gigawatt hours over the course of the year, not being concerned particularly as to when that renewable energy is being generated, just that we wanna make sure that we're putting uh, on the grid 50% renewable energy to meet our load. So in some hours, we might have renewables higher than that 50% target, and in other hours, there might be less. Um, but as we transition a time coincident, and China's trying to meet this on an annual basis, like once a year, we need to meet this 87, 60 hours per year, every hour of every day. Next slide. So this is a, a graph that kind of shows how you try to, to meet this. This is from Google where they are trying to um, match their load to carbon-free power. And this is an example of a, of a data center. So that red line is the electricity use for the data center. It's just flat because computers are running constantly all the time. And it shows that when they contract for solar in the middle of the day, there are hours when they're receiving more solar energy than they need. But then there are other hours indicated by the black parts of the bars that are uh, carbon-based energy or you know, not carbon-free. So those are hours where they're getting fossil-based fossil power. Over the course of the day, it may be um, totally, uh, when, you, when you add it up over the course of the day, they're meeting their load with renewable energy, but on an hour-by-hour -hour basis, they are not matching it. And that's the trick that we're trying to, to do here. Next. So this is our load shape and the resources that we currently have contracted for uh, in 2025. So um, this shows four different seasons of the year. The first part is winter in January, March representing spring, July representing summer, October representing fall. And we've contracted already for power from the Wright Solar Project and the Mustang Solar Project and we need to fill in all of these other hours with resources that will meet our load on an hourly basis. Next. So we need data and control over when that energy is delivered for each of the projects and to be able to um, put these different generation shapes and variabilities into our mix and then add energy storage in there to meet, um, you know, to, to shift some of that power to different hours of the day as needed. So um, if we actually just go back a slide and we look at the solar, you know, if, no, the other way, yeah. So um, say like if in um, hour ending 10, we're getting more solar than we need, we could store that solar um, power in a battery and then release it into the grid in hour ending 18 to meet our peak so that we're, we're um, have our, the ability to adjust when the power is actually going into the grid to meet our load. So next slide. So different contract structures provide different amounts of data and control. And um, so that's kind of where we are. So if we go to the last slide here, our recommendation is to um, 
have carbon free at this time represent California RPS eligible renewable energy because these are the only types of resources right now that we can contract for and know how much those resources are generating on an hourly basis. If we look at large hydro, which is, is uh, carbon free, but not renewable, we are not able to contract with large hydro sources and get a guaranteed hourly schedule of energy deliveries from those resources. So for example, if we contract with PG&E, who has hydro in California, uh, what they've told us is that they would tell us after the fact, a quarter later than we've gotten the, the power, what they actually delivered to us. So that, that makes it impossible for us to um, include that resource if we want to meet this goal. Additionally, you know, what we're trying to do is, is uh, very innovative. No one else has done this before. And we really want to move the needle in terms of in innovation. Because if we can show that we can do this, it will greatly um, help move California and, um, and the country to, to being completely sustainable. There also are demand side tools that we can use. So we're talking about the supply side here, but we can also do some things on the demand side, setting our rates such that we encourage people to use energy when rates are lower. So maybe we would offer lower rates during the daytime and higher rates in the evening. And actually that is going to happen when we transition into this time of use energy rates. And we can also use, um, possibly use batteries in electric vehicles as another source or encourage people to charge their batteries in their cars at certain times. So there's a lot of things that are going to be developing in the next five years as we work towards this goal um, that are on the demand side. And we also would suggest that we revisit this goal with the board, uh, depending on the economic viability of this approach, because the current goal is to do this, um, provided it is uh, financially feasible to do it. So our recommendation is that we define carbon free at this time to be California RPS eligible renewable energy. And if we go to the next slide, uh, that we would show that in the strategic plan at this point as carbon free is resources that can be scheduled by PCE on an hourly basis. So um, happy to answer any questions that board members have about this. And um, Siobhan, if there's anything that if you're still on, if there's anything I've left out, uh, please feel free to jump in as well. I'm not sure she's still on. I am, I am on. Um, oh, I, you are. Oh, I, I see job, you there. But I'm happy okay. to answer questions if there are any. Okay, uh, thank you, Jan. Um, for the, is, are there any board members with questions for Jan or Siobhan? Okay, uh, Donna, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, so my question, just my one question on this, Jan, is, um, this is a going forward situation, I take it, and it, this relates to the fact that we had the PCIA discussion around the large hydro and the nuclear piece that we accepted in. So I just want to make sure that that decision is fine and still stands, um, or are you anticipating that somehow this would impact that? Uh, no, this is regarding our 2025 goal on the 100% carbon free on a time coincident basis. Um, regarding the allocation from PG&E on the large hydro and the nuclear, um, I think the decision was that when we actually get the allocation that we would bring that back to the board. Because um, at that point we'll know, we, we were just had estimates at the time as to what that was. And, and um, so I think we'll probably be bringing that to the board in in May when we, we get the actual allocation and know the numbers, but that's, that's not related to this. Okay, great. That's all I wanted to clarify. Thank you so much. Okay. Rick has his hand up. Go ahead, Rick. Uh, so I understand the problem, like what Jan articulated is the problem with pg &E's large hydro. That makes lots of sense. I mean, that is not going to satisfy our need 
for um, uh, being able to calculate uh, uh, time coincident uh, carbon free power. But uh, it's not clear to me that that wouldn't, that we couldn't obtain large hydro that would satisfy a time based analysis if the, you know, from other sources than PG&E. Uh, so I, I don't know why we need to tie ourselves to the definition of uh, carbon free as being RPS. I have a lot of problems with that, which I could go into, but I wanna make sure that we have a uh, workable solution, which would be, uh, you know that we could continue to use large hydro. We could we could use uh, power that is carbon free, which some of the RPS isn't, and uh, and I, we could obviously use RPS power as part of that carbon free solution. But the carb the RPS definition is so political that um, I think the, that would be a mistake for us to go with that. But I want to make sure that w we can use large hydro uh, for uh, w with uh, a time-based uh, uh, knowledge that it can satisfy us, like PG&E's uh, large hydro sounds like it can't. Yeah, maybe Siobhan, can you speak to that on the, our current contracts for large hydro? Yeah. Um... I think PG&E owns a lot of the large hydro in California. Um, and I think most of the rest of it is owned or a lot of the rest of it is owned by municipal utilities who rely on the electricity from that to meet their load. Um, so most of that, because there is no requirement around greenhouse gas emissions um, and there isn't a lot of before CCAs came into existence, there wasn't a lot of value given to those carbon free attributes. Um, the municipal utilities have been willing to sell those attributes to us, but they have not been willing to contract in a different way for hydro in a way that would allow us to control the hydro resources because they're using that to satisfy their own load obligations. But, but what about hydro from the Pacific Northwest? I thought we were buying a significant amount of hydro from the Northwest. We buy some from the Northwest. Um, that comes with problems as far as trying to get transmission capacity to bring it into California. And that can be very complicated and difficult. Um, most, a lot of that is already owned by different entities, by the municipal utilities um, and by some marketers um, and scheduling when that comes in and paying for that to come into California is a, is a pretty complicated process. And so, it, but are, are we not doing that now? We are not taking on that obligation right now. We're relying on whoever we're buying it from to schedule the power, and they schedule it based on whether the power prices in California or the Northwest, um, wh wherever the greater power prices are. And a lot of the Northwest Hydro is in big systems like Bonville Power. Um, right. And so we couldn't control just a part of their system. We would just, right now, we just procure that on an annual basis. Um, we wouldn't be able to just procure from one of their power plants. And if I recall correctly, when you buy from Bonneville, you're actually buying power that could be coming from a coal plant at a given time of day. Is that still correct? The Bonneville um, system, they sell what's called asset controlling supplier. So they're assigned a very, very low emissions factor, um, but they are not able to separate their system out into individual plants. Okay. Okay, Daniel's got his hand up. Go ahead, Daniel. Uh, hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Sounds great. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Thank you also for the nine page memo. Um, one of those on the board subcommittee that uh, thought this should come to the board. Uh, you know, it's a big decision here. Um, and, and I really benefited from the memo and, and the discussion. And, you know, my instinct here is to take the staff recommendation, obviously happy to continue the discussion. 
Um, one thing I'm pleased to see, you know, it, it, I mean, it looks like if at some point we were able to schedule small hydro or, you know, I read about, you know, innovations about uh, creating energy through, you know, installing, uh, you know, something in, in pipes that water is flowing through, which you would instinctively think you could schedule. But in any event, you know, if that counts as small hydro, that would meet our definition anyways. And then in terms of, you know, to the extent we're giving up, uh, you know, power large hydro from the Pacific Northwest, you know, s someone else can be using that, that power. And we're, you know, being, you know, cutting edge and, uh, you know, we relied on it for a little while to make our goals, but now it looks like we're, we feel that it's possible to get 24 by 7 clean energy um, using the California RPS definition uh, and still do this, you know, on an hourly basis. Um, so I'm uh, happy to have the discussion continue, but uh, based on the, the staff report and presentation, I'm comfortable with the staff recommendation. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, John has his hand up. Go ahead, John. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so I, I'm concerned about um, the flexibility of this, po this policy. Uh, so say, for example, and it seems kind of unlikely now, but it could happen in the future that uh, PG&E has to sell uh, not just their large hydro, but their uh, large hydro plants to someone else that is more willing to uh, enter into contracts with us. And so if that were the case, um, would we be able to uh, modify our policy? That that is my only concern. Yeah, I, th I think that's our recommendation. Uh, if we go back one slide, um, the last bullet, I think we said that, um, can we go back one slide? To revisit the goal, uh, depending on the economic viability, we, I mean, we can also revisit it based on changes in the market. So, um, you know, right now, when we look forward and who owns the hydro. And we also, I mean, I, I doubt pg e is going to sell their hydro resources to someone else. But I mean, if they did, and there was a way for us to be able to schedule it uh, to meet our needs, then we would certainly be able to take another look at this. Good, then, then I support this. Okay, thanks, John. Um, any other board members have a comment right now? Uh, okay, I don't see any. So, uh, Tom, oh, uh, Rick, why don't you go ahead? Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, the committee for this really in-depth work. And I've read this uh, staff recommendation three times today. And it really <laughs> makes all the sense in the world to me after looking at and studying all the slides. Um, and thinking about everything that we've learned and come to know during our few years here as PCE. So I uh, strongly support this uh, policy recommendation. Thank you, Rick. Uh, any other board members? Okay. Uh, anyone on the phone from the board who wants to comment? Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, who's that? Jeff, this is, oh, sorry, this is Julia. I, I don't know how to raise my hand on this. I apologize. And I, I guess it's because oh, okay. I'm using my phone. Um, I just wanted to uh, circle back a little bit with what um, Rick DeGolia said regarding his concerns with the term um, RPS eligible. And uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, Rick, but did you have um, another suggestion or recommendation, um, a substitute wording it, that would make you know, uh, make it better or make you more comfortable? 
well, uh, I think that we can, I mean, w w if what we're talking about is carbon free power, then obviously the staff needs to do an analysis of what of how we would define that. And it's not, and, and I'm surprised that the Pacific Northwest power doesn't satisfy that. But that's perfectly understandable to me. And, and I thought what was said was clear. Um, my problem with RP and, and I don't think we have to use RPS as the definition because RP using RPS ties us into a set of power options that include, for example, biomass, which is taking dead trees from the forest and burning them and generating electricity. That power is considered renewable in California, which I think is utterly ridiculous. And I, I will not vote for this if that's going to be uh, where we're going to go. I, I just don't, it's not what I support. Um, I, I think we can uh, uh, elect to, to define exactly what carbon free power is. And I think that would be a great thing for the CCA movement for us to do. Uh, it, I, we're trying to do something new here uh, with um, uh, timing the clean energy with the time of usage. And that's a really important thing for us to do for ourselves and for the entire CCA movement. Uh, but to tie us to what has been defined by the legislature's RPS, I just think a huge mistake for a variety of reasons. Uh, and um, I don't think we need to do that in order to get uh, the power that we, we can take all the power from RPS that we consider to be carbon free without taking the power that isn't carbon free. And we don't, that doesn't require us to tie ourselves to RPS. Can, can folks still hear me? Yes. Hello. Uh, I'm wondering, yeah. um, is it possible for us to, um, you know, somehow vote, um, but make a recommendation that, um, you know, staff work on this wording or RPS, uh, certain RPS eligible somehow better define it. Um, I know it's, it's a, I mean, it's, I think Rick has some good points, but I'm just wondering, it's, it's probably, we're, it sounds like we're pretty close. I, uh, go ahead, Rick. Actually, this is Daniel. Um, Go ahead, Daniel. Maybe, uh, maybe staff can reply to Rick's comment. I mean, I don't know if we plan to buy biomass or or not, for example. We have typically not. I, what I was what I was going to say is, you know what? It's sort of this. I mean, it's helpful to have this defined either GHG free or RPS eligible. Personally, what I like about RPS eligible is that it you know, it does encourage the development of certain new resources, particularly wind and solar and some small hydro. Uh, you know, we're going to be revisiting this, this whole question going forward. I don't think anybody wants to buy biomass anytime in the near future um, I, for various reasons. Um, I kind of like the idea of just being able to point to RPS eligible and say that we're, we're complying with it. Um, and even, you know, even be, being able to say if it's not, it's not an easy marketing sell, but even, even being able to say we're RPS eligible, but we're not buying biomass. So we're actually slightly better than RPS. Um, again, I, you know, I, we're, we're going to keep revisiting this going forward. I, I kind of personally like the idea of, of trying to comply with RPS, meaning that it will encourage new sources of both renewable and carbon free sort of energy. Uh, Donna, you had your hand up. Go ahead. Thanks, guys. Sorry if I was eating dinner with everybody there, just for a moment. Um, hey, I, I just, um, my question really is around, again, flexibility of the policy and in also encompassing the conversation around nuclear, which um, I know there's probably going to be 
changes in technology along the lines in the future that may or may not make that more tenable for an organization like ours. And so I'm really just kind of, I want to make sure that when we put it in something in place, we're, we're not so grounded that if it becomes unable to be met because battery storage doesn't get there or doesn't keep up, that we have, you know, the ability to come back and take a look at it. I, I also am a little worried about the future PCIA allocations and I, I want to make sure or I want to understand how you know, we just had it happen this year. I assume it'll happen again every year that they'll offer us something. Um, if that, I, maybe I'm wrong on that, Jan, I could, I'd love to hear about that. And if so, then would we be, we'd have to turn down those energy sources and resupplement um, those with other sources. And we would essentially, you know, be double purchasing in the future again. So those, those are kind of my questions. Yeah, um, so this is the 2025 goal. And um, as far as receiving allocations from PG&E for their large hydro or their nuclear, the nuclear plant is gonna be shut down starting in 2024. So, um, and California does not allow any more nuclear. So that isn't even going to be an option uh, in 2025 and beyond. Um, as far as this large hydro goes, um, you know, right now we are not able to contract for that the way we would like, as we kind of explained before. So, um, Jen, and, and, and there not there will not be any new uh, dams built. There will not be any new large dams built. You know, there are people who want to take down the dams that currently exist. So. Um, if we're looking to try to, you know, provide more GHG free or carbon free, it's going to be solar, it's going to be wind. Um, you know, I understand, uh, I want to respond to Rick too regarding the biomass. And, you know, that's a controversial issue as well, because some people say, well, it's better to take those dead trees out of the forest and burn them in a controlled environment in a biomass plant rather than have them go up in a forest fire where there is no control over the pollution. So, I mean, that's a, you know, a lot of these things, they're not cut and dry issues. Um, but we, we liked this because this is actually the only um, definition that is out there. And as you can see, we're struggling when we say carbon free, there is no statutory definition of carbon free. Um, this is the only statutory definition that exists. And so because of that, we thought this was kind of the, the cleanest because although we may not agree with how it's being defined, it is something that has a specific definition. And if you, know, you want to say, we'll do this, but without biomass or, um, or uh, you know, we, we, can, we can do that as well. Okay. Uh, Tom Cabot has been ha has been waiting patiently. Uh, Tom, why don't you uh, why don't you weigh in here? Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so I'm Tom Cabot, and for full disclosure, I am a, a consultant to the federal government on marketing large and small hydropower to municipalities and CCEs. Uh, but mostly, I want to talk about um, your larger goal is helping the county decarbonize and showing leadership in decarbonizing everything so that really that's vehicles and buildings and the way to do it is to keep your rates affordable I think as so that people can afford to electrify and as I look forward at, at more and more electrification going on and higher um, renewable content most of the renewables we get produce a lot more in the summer and a lot less in the winter especially the ones you're talking about wind and solar and so we end up running into a problem of how to match things hourly. And so, uh, you know, I think we probably ought to focus on the big picture, which is making annual um, 
annual carbon balancing or annual energy balancing and low cost and really pushing for decarbonization, the rapid progress of getting rid of fossil fuel combustion in buildings and cars and using the cost advantage to help do that and not, not deploying your net revenue into um, uh, trying to get too far ahead of where the utility industry in California will have to go. It just looks like a hard place for PCE to lead. Whereas an easy place for PCE to lead is in your work with reach codes and your work with innovative ways to get electrification into uh, share or ride shares and things like that. And so I want to support directing most energy into decarbonizing in the big picture as opposed to making a very pretty portfolio. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. That's a, that's a good point. Uh, Mark has his hand up. Go ahead, Mark. Okay. Um, the first thing is that the battery, on the battery side, we've had some breakthroughs. We're looking at uh, being able to sell certainly, well, 600 mi million kilowatt hours per year for the first factory. And and, and, and it worked second year 900 million, the third year 1200 million as we get better at it. The uh, cost of that, we should be able to work something out with a public agency like EPCE to sell under, well under $100 a kilowatt hour without disturbing the commercial market. Um, on solar, uh, we're looking at 40 to 50% efficiency instead of the normal 24% efficiency. So what that means, and we're looking at being able again to do low cost. What that means is that we can get for the same space, we can get twice the energy. And for the same size battery, we can get 10 times the amount of battery, the amount of storage. Um, and the uh, the idea of putting up canopies for every for enough canopy for both buildings and all the vehicles around them uh, is something to look at um, and for transmission capacity that's something we can use batteries to store at each end of a, of a transmission line to so you're feeding a constant amount whenever you can and taking out a constant amount and um, Demand response, right. The other piece of this is uh, demand response. Um, when you have, when we make every vehicle electric and, and there's enough electricity being generated in the county to cover all the vehicles and all the buildings or something, some part of that, then you have this great big bank and you can contract for the, uh, the service levels, you have guaranteed service levels people could contract for discounts or things, or you know, basically you could set it up so you can always guarantee that within the, con within the context of those contracts, you are able to have the, your, your guaranteed level. And I can explain that in more detail when I'm not trying to beat the clock. Okay, thanks Mark. Um, okay, is there any other uh, board comments on this? I, I, I don't know if we're giving you clear guidance, Jan. Um, well, I, I think we've heard um, general agreement with the staff recommendation, but also allowing for maybe relooking at it on a regular basis as technology or economics change. So that that's kind of what I feel like I've heard. Just, yeah, just trying to put together everything that I've heard, you know, this question of, you know, we've, we've said all along that we wanted to be carbon free if it was, if it was feasible in terms, particularly in terms of cost. So I, I feel like as we move forward and we're looking at more contracts and real numbers in front of us in terms of what's, what's, what, what it would actually cost us to be RPS eligible versus greenhouse gas free or some other definition. I, I think as time goes on and we have a chance to sort of look at the definition in terms of what it's actually costing us and how viable it is, it'll, some of these decisions will start being a little clearer to make, I think. Right, right now mm -hmm. we're talking, it's kind of abstract, but uh, I, I, we're going to be refining this and I think we'll have some more concrete decisions to make going forward. 
Uh, and uh, Rick, I mean, oh, go ahead, Jen. Yeah, I mean, I, the staff would not be putting this forth if we didn't feel like this is a viable um, option. You know, we think that we can do this. Okay. So yeah. other, we, you know, we, we know that you all uh, uh, encourage innovation and that you know some things will work and some things won't work. Um, but we do think um, based on our experience in, in the industry and where we see trends going, we do believe that this is possible to do and that it would be economically viable. But, you know, if we find that it's not, we certainly will come back to the board and, and ask to uh, change the, uh, the path that we're on. And we'll be reviewing all of our financials every quarter between now and then. So, yes. Yes. Uh, thank you. Rick has his hand up. Go ahead, Rick. Thank you. Thank you. So I appreciate all the discussion we've had tonight. And I um, especially like the bottom line on the recommendation, which is that we're going to revisit. But still, I have to say that when I heard Rick DeGolia talking about biomass, and I've always, biomass has always put a bad taste in my mouth. Um, I'm wondering, as I look at the list of, uh, in the recommendation that I'm seeing in the uh, supplement that was sent out tonight. Um, I'm wondering, can we drop biomass from the mix that we're talking about? Just to put it bluntly. <laughs> uh, Jan, Siobhan, do you wanna comment on that? We, we can drop it. We don't typically, um, we haven't contracted for any biomass directly because it's actually not price competitive. In some of the contracts that we've had with, um, say like Direct Energy, when they've put a portfolio together for us and they've contracted with lots of different resources, there has been some biomass in that, um, in their portfolio. But we have not uh, ever signed a contract with a biomass project directly. Um, we've, we've gotten some proposals from some biomass, but it's not, you know, the solar is way less expensive. Solar plus storage is way less expensive. So we haven't moved in that direction. Siobhan, do you want to add anything to that? Um, no, I think that's accurate. The biomass PPAs are very expensive, um, especially compared to other resources. Um, and I don't think there's going to be a lot of new biomass plants being built in California either. Most of the new construction we're seeing is for solar projects, um, and then a little bit for wind and a little bit for geothermal. Okay, um, I, I think the guidance there is clear. I think, I think that, you know, you, I think staff is aware of how the board feels in general about biomass. So uh, I think I'd like to move on from this one. Um, okay. Assuming, Great, you, thank you. assuming you have the guidance that you're, you're looking for. Yes, very much so. Thank you. We really appreciate all of the conversation. And I know it's difficult when we're doing this remotely and it's been, uh, it's been very good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and, and uh, Jan, did you, I, my understanding was you wanted to, uh, you wanted to table this item 10 until future meeting. Yes. Um, we had originally put this on because we, um, the, the date that we had to get the IRP to the Public Utilities Commission was July 1st. Today, the PUC um, passed a decision pushing that date back to September 1st. So um, we are, suggest that we move this to another meeting. And it's also 9.26 p.m., so <laughs> it's, it's getting late. Yeah, yes. Okay. Then item 10 is tabled. Uh, that brings us to uh, item last, which is staff reports. Uh, any board members care to share anything with us while we're all together? Okay, I don't see any hands up. Anybody on the phone wanted to chime in? Okay, uh, again, not seeing any comments or hearing any comments. I just want to thank everyone for uh, for bearing with us on this, our first virtual meeting. Um, let me know if you've got comments or ideas on how to, how to make these work even better going forward. And um, just stay safe and uh, keep keep reminding your constituents to stay home and, uh, and do their part. Uh, thank you all, and I'll uh, be talking to you all soon. Take Good night. Care. Thank you.
Good night. Thank you. Thanks. Good Thank night. you all. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Goodbye.